Hello, everybody. Welcome to track two, a very well-subscribed track two, it seems. Um, if anybody here is a bit uncomfortable, because we're a bit busy in here, we're actually streaming uh, this into the games room. So if you're interested, if you're feeling a bit uncomfortable sitting on the floor or standing up, you can head over to the games room and you can watch it from there. No takers. OK, a few takers. All right, OK. so. Without further ado, everybody, uh, welcome to Automating UI Development. Um, we've got two fantastic speakers for you today, Stefan and Katrin. Uh, Stefan leads the web, web experience and design ops teams at Dynatrace. He's also an author and a conference organizer, and also an amateur theater actor. Um, Katrin works as a design ops engineer. She works both on, on the design side and on the engineering side and is the organizer of Dev1 Conference in Linz. She also claims to make the best Apple strudel in the world, <laughs> something which I've uh, signed myself up for testing. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Stefan and Katrin. Hi, everybody. I'm super happy to be here today. And yes, I can make the best Apple strudel in the world. Thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, after this amazing keynote and kicking off this nice conference, it's now our turn. And we will talk about automating UI development. My name is Katrin, and I work as a web developer and also as a UX designer at Dynatrace in Austria. And I'm also one of the organizers of Dev1 Conf. And today, I'm here together with my colleague, mentor, and friend, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Stefan. Uh, I'm Dad Parrot on Twitter. And I have a little side project called JavaScript Podcast. It's on JavaScriptPodcast.com. And it's a podcast about JavaScript. <laughs> so uh, if you like, please check it out. Let me know what you think. We feature interviews and conference talks and beer garden chats. So I guess there's something in there for everybody. And let me know what you think. And uh, like Katrin said, um, we work at Dynatrace. And I want to spend just a few words about Dynatrace so that you know where we are coming from and which challenges we face and which things brought us to what we're going to show you today. And Dynatrace is in software intelligence. So we create an application performance monitoring tool. And uh, we monitor your full stack, so end-to-end -end visibility be it your mean stack running in your Docker container on your Kubernetes cluster in your most favorite cloud provider, if that's a thing. <laughs> uh, we know what's going on in there, and we can give you invisibility. And as you have seen from the product screens, um, there's lots of stuff going on. So it's, it's lots of different screens focusing on different problems and on different problem domains. And that's how we organize ourselves as well. So we're working in different expert groups, uh, and each expert group is focusing on one particular problem domain. And we are talking here about more than 600 developers, designers, and product managers working together on a single product, which also means on a single product UI. And you can think of that as having the most specialized and most fitting solution for the current problem domain that you are currently looking on. And with all those different expert groups and all the things that, going on, that are going on here, um, we, you can think of our whole UI as being highly specialized screens fitting for the problem you're looking at, uh, with lots of generic and very flexible components. And as you all probably know, good UX design means also consistency. And therefore, we are using core UI components, for example, buttons and cards and tiles. And we maintain these core UI components in an Angular components library. So this is one of the examples, um, a screen that we are currently working on, the Cloud Foundry screen. And as our UX designers work on this screen, they may come to the point where one of the core components does not really fit their design. And therefore, and for the purpose of this presentation, we are going to update the button design. So the first thing, the first step in this process is to talk to the other designers and developers of the team. Our design team at Dynatrace works cross lab and also from all over the world, which means they have to discuss all the possibilities for a new button design, and they have to make sure that a new proposal fits the product, but also all other UI components. 
So in the end, they decide with which version we will move on. And the next step is to update all mockups that are currently uh, in the queue and where they are currently working on. Our design team works with a tool that is called Sketch. And a Sketch is a software to create mockups and UX designs. The cool thing about Sketch is that it uses the Symbols library underneath. And the Symbols library holds all our UI components and everything that can and should be reused in a UI. You could think of it like the Angular components library, but instead of code, it just holds the visual representation of the components. And with these symbols, it's much easier for us to make sure that our mockups and afterwards our product has this consistent look and feel. We store the library in Git, so therefore all our designers are always up to date with the latest design changes. And um, we also have the symbols library as a basis for our design system. Our design system is called Barista because we love coffee. Um, and it holds all the resources for our colleagues. Of course, also the UI components, the core components, all the definitions, use cases, and documentation. About all the variants of a button, for example, a secondary button, primary, or icon button, and also interactive demos and API documentation. This is a very important and powerful tool for us because it helps us to keep design teams and development teams in sync. And therefore, it's crucial that the design system is always up to date with the latest design. So now it would be time for some code. But wait a second. At this point of the process, and that's also the problem with it, we have no idea how this design change might affect the rest of the product. Because in the end, there is not only the Cloud Foundry screen. As Stefan told you before and showed you the other screens and use cases of the Dynatrace platform, and we have no idea how this will be affected by our code change. But as we move on and changing the code in our Angular library, this will affect the product and therefore the whole Dynatrace platform. To sum our process up, from the initial idea, we kicked off the whole design process. And we updated all designers with our Sketch Symbols library. And then we got to the code part. We updated our Angular library and therefore also the product code. Both the, the Angular components library as well as the sketch symbols library come together to the Barista design system. <laughs> and now it's time for the challenges with this process and why we changed it. So as you probably all know, sometimes designs don't work out as they were planned to. So you have to go back. And maybe you even have to go back to the initial idea. And if you're lucky, you can continue coding. But sometimes this just takes too long, and PM goes directly to the dev team. And yes, there are the special ideas which go nowhere. So, this is a broken process, as you can see. This is a waterfall organized in sprints. And each and every of these steps could and will take a whole sprint. So we have to change this, because this is slow, cumbersome, and frustrating for everybody. Most importantly, our design and dev teams are never in sync. They live in completely different worlds. So now that we know we want to change something, we had this idea of taking the thing at the very end, our Angular components library, and put it in the center of everything. So then now when we change, for example, our button color, 
together with our designers, we can have this change immediately in our design system and also in the product code. From there, we could then update our designers. So that's the big question, and that's the basis of our project we are presenting today. How could we possibly get these code changes automatically to our designs and to our mockups? We could therefore use the sketch library. As you remember, the library is the basis of our mockups and of our designs. So yeah, so how do we get to uh, an automatically generated sketch library? Uh, and just like Katrin said, we're putting the very end and are focusing on that right now. So let's see how, what do we need to create a sketch library, a sketch symbol library, and find our way back to the Angular component library. Uh, and I don't know if you, if you know it, but sketch is merely a bunch of JSON files. So you can unzip that, and you look at a couple of JSON files. They are huge, they take several megabytes, blowing up your editor, but hey, if it's JSON, you know what that means. If you're a developer like me and your development sense is tingling, it means that we can hack that. And that's actually what we do. So what we are looking for is CSS equivalents for sketch JSON. And let's take the button example again, because buttons are very easy to reason about, um, but make it even simpler. Uh, and let's remove the text. Let's just look at the button without any text, a blue rectangle. And for sketch, elements are organized in groups. And those groups span a frame, like in this example. Um, the frame has the exact same dimensions as uh, the CSS um, that is representative of that. So in that regard, it's a width of 122 pixel and a height of 32 pixel. Um, but with the frame alone, we don't have any, any shape yet. It's just uh, a canvas where we can draw upon. What creates a shape then is, uh, well, a layer with a shape path. So instead of, of drawing a rectangle there, we are creating a shape path that spans a rectangle, and it spans the coordinates 0, 0 to 1.1. Now we have the shape. To make it visible, we need to apply a fill color. And the fill color also is directly translatable uh, from the background color uh, in CSS. So yeah, uh, this is a very simplified version uh, of what a simple rectangle could look like. Uh, the truth is a little bit more verbose. It looks something like this. Yeah, so <laughs> That's, that's quite a lot. <laughs> but truth be told, there's not just CSS properties that we translate. There's also lots of properties in there that are specific to, to Sketch, like is this layer locked or can it be transformed? There's also some metadata in there, like uh, which artboard is it on, which page is it on, um, all things that we don't have in CSS but we need for Sketch anyway. But hey, those are default values. We can just apply that. Uh, speaking of properties, uh, those are the properties that we are able to parse next to width and height, uh, and we can bucket them in four different groups. Uh, one group would be shapes, so everything that is uh, um, respective to width, height, shadows, and borders, um, and also border radius. You can translate them to corner radius in Sketch. Um, this is the first bucket. The second bucket is all about colors, so fill colors for SVG, background colors for um, for normal CSS and HTML elements, um, we can translate them as well. The third group is all about fonts. Font family, letter spacing, font size, everything that, we can translate that also. And the last one is all about visibility, being entirely visible, entirely invisible, something in between, that's also something that we can translate. And for all those properties, we also feature default values. And you can think of those default values as some sort of browser style sheet. So in the browser, when you're writing CSS, you just write the properties that are different from what the browser provides you already. Um, and we are doing the same thing here with Sketch. If we need a certain rule, or an, uh, if a shape or a group needs a certain rule, we can find that in our CSS declaration. We get it from there, combine those two things, and can create the shape. So yeah, the first thing is done. From every element, and with every CSS declaration, we can create groups and respective sketch files. But that's not all. So 
Now we know if we have a bunch of CSS declarations, we can generate JSON out of it. The cool thing here is that this is fully automated. We don't need Sketch for that, like some other solutions do. So we can run that in our CI and do that with every commit uh, um, to master. Um, the question is now, how do we get to those CSS declaration files? And for that, we wrote two more tools. Uh, one is a component demo application, which shows a single component after another. So just one component, which you can look at and which we can parse, and then the next one. And those components have a direct reference to our Angular component library. So those are the Angular components that we create. Uh, the other thing is a CSS scraper. And the CSS scraper does one thing. It injects a little JavaScript, an agent, into this web application. And this works with any web application. It just works particularly well with our web application. But in theory and in practice, it works with every web application. This agent has one particular task. It traverses the DOM element by element and calls two functions. First, it calls get computed style. And get computed style gives us all the necessary CSS properties without looking at the cascade or inheritance. So cascade and inheritance are applied to those properties, and you get everything that is applied to this particular element. Sketch doesn't have the cascade. Sketch doesn't have inheritance. So we can't translate it. We need everything that is at this particular element at this particular time. And we're also calling get bounding client rect. And this gives us all the information about dimensions with height, position. And we need that to form that frame and position it in our canvas. We're doing the same thing also for nested elements. So if we have, for example, a wrapping element, a wrapping div, we call the same two methods because, you know, no inheritance, no cascade, not knowing where the properties come from, might be nested groups. So we take this and parse that as well, and also nested elements, uh, which also means that you can have nested groups in Sketch. So this works as well. We take all that information and send it back to the CSS scraper. And the CSS scraper stores everything for us. Now, I told you that this particular app is special because we look at every component after another, every component in detail without any distractions. So what this, the CSS scraper has another big task, and it is to tell the app to update to the next component. So in the next step, the CSS scraper calls update. The application removes the old component, loads in the new, and the whole thing starts again. OK, we're getting there. Now we have a component app, and we run it through the CSS scraper. We get CSS declarations, run it through the sketch generator. We are almost there, but we are not yet at our Angular component library. We still need something to fully automate that. Of course, we could provide this, this component app ourselves. We could manually code it. But you know what happens if somebody has to do something manually? It never happens in the future again. So we want to generate this app as well. And finally, we're here with our Angular component library. And our Angular component library, probably much like yours, is written in TypeScript. And TypeScript um, has a very good feature that is very uh, crucial for us. Um, TypeScript has an API where we can look at the code that's being parsed, and we can fetch things out of that. And we are doing that with all the decorators that give, uh, give us meta information about all the components that we are looking at. So the first thing that we do is we run the Angular component library through TypeScript, and we create an abstract syntax tree out of that. And this abstract syntax tree contains all the decorator information, all the meta information. And from that, we need to get two things, a pure example and all the variants of a component. So what do I mean with that? Let's look at the example first. A pure example for a button, for example, might look something like this. It's the simplest and most easy form that a component can take. So there's no distractions, no variants applied, no properties applied, also no event handlers, just this little bit of markup. Uh, put it in your app, and you have a simple button. And through the app six syntax tree, we're looking at the template. So we're fetching this basic template. Next, we want to get all variants of this component. And for that, we look at the component itself. And the component, this is a very much simplified version of a button, um, has input decorators. And the input decorators provide us with the API for that component. So this is our way to change something in the component, to get something for that. In that case, the property is called variant, our API is called variant. And through TypeScript, we also know which values it can take. In that case, primary and secondary. We need one more thing from that component, 
and that is the selector. And with that selector, we are able to match everything we have in the pure example with what we have in the component, and that's how we can apply all those properties, all those variants to the pure example and generate all those pages. So in the next step, we take everything, combine it, and generate simple pages with just one component at a time. We do that for every component and generate this Angular application, this Angular component application that we run in RCI. And there we are. We made the full journey from the sketch library, from the sketch symbol library to the Angular component library. And the cool thing is, again, we can fully automate that. So let's go back to Katrin's example, where we made a change in a button and we made a blue color for our previously green button. Once this commit happens in Mars in our component library, CI kicks off, and the new code is sent to the app generator. The app generator then creates this component app. The CSS scraper injects an agent into this component app and downloads all the CSS information that it can find for every component and every component variant. We send a bunch of CSS declaration files to the sketch generator. The sketch generator does its magic and... <laughs> a new sketch library is born. And that's how it looks in action. So this is a small demo that we recorded. We can start it. Now we are generating the application. The application takes a little time to boot up. Just a little time, and this is where the fun begins. So this is my most favorite part. In debug mode, you can see a Chrome, and we have a ton of icons, apparently. Around 700. 660, something like that. So we are getting to real components as well. It takes some time, but we are fetching CSS for every component. By the way, we can also do SVG, so just on a side note. Then we generate those uh, sketch files, and here we are. That's our sketch library, our sketch symbol library. Those are all the icons I was telling you about. Those are all the button variants. We have a, a couple of them. And the cool thing is, you know that you can take Angular components inside your Angular components, and we can do the same thing here in Sketch. So we have Sketch symbols inside Sketch symbols, and here we are changing the color to yellow, much to the uh, frightened faces of our designers, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, that's the tool. That's amazing, right? I mean, that's pretty cool. And let's have a look what this really means for our process. So we came from this ugly, cumbersome, and slow process to something really cool and super nice. Um, we have this change that now we have a single source of truth that lives in code. And our development and design teams are now 100% aligned and in sync, and this automatically. Even the names of the components are the same because they are generated from the component library. But this also means that we can now verify any design changes, core design changes, immediately and across the whole Dynatrace platform. No more handovers from sprint to sprint, from development to design back and forth. And we got new contributors because now our designers can update their sketch files with code. We also have all these code updates immediately visible in our design system, Barista. And all of this brings me to the question, if we can use this with every web page and every application and we can generate our symbols, is there more? Yes. <laughs> there is a little bit more. So um, we, have, we have this workflow where a designer creates a full page screen mock at some point in time so that you get a feel how the page looks like, which component it has, and this is the initial goal for having it in the product. From time to time, our designers have to make an iteration on that particular page, half a year later, several months later, and you know, uh, during that time, uh, everything that happens in the product evolves much, much faster and you would always have to start anew uh, uh, with your mocks because they are outdated very, very fast. But with the technology that we have, with the agent that we can inject into any uh, web page that there is, and with the information that we have from our Angular components, which translate directly into sketch symbols, we are working uh, uh, on a prototype that 
does the following. It's a small Chrome extension that injects the CSS agent and sends all the data to our servers and creates uh, a sketch file to download. And once we open that, wait for it, uh, we have the exact same page and also with the DOM structure intact. And this also means that we have information about all the symbols we are using uh, in our symbol library, and designers can start from that for the next iteration. So I think this is pretty amazing. <laughs> and speaking of amazing, um, there's a person in the audience today, uh, uh, Lukas Holzer, who is the creative mind behind all that. He, he actually worked his, he worked his ass off in the last six months to get to all of that. And uh, Lukas is here in the audience today, and um, please have a round of applause for Lukas because he did such a great job. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Uh, come to us in the office hours or reach out on Twitter, whatever fits you best. And it was a pleasure to be in here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan and Catherine. That was amazing. Really great. Okay, so uh, up next is a talk on NG Upgrade by Sam over in track one. And here we've got a talk on RxJS schedulers. Uh, that's all kicking off in 11.55, so in eight minutes' time. See you all soon. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to track two, another busy track two. Great, brilliant. Um, we're also continuing the Austrian theme on this track. Um, our next speaker, Michael, is from Vienna. He's a certified Google developer expert and an organizer of Angular Vienna and the founder of Angular Austria, which is a non-profit organization supporting Angular. So please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Michael. One, two, one, two. Test, test. Hello? So, how many of you know RxJS or ever used it? Nearly everyone. How many of you know schedulers? Some. And how many of you ever used a scheduler? 2%, something like that. Well, uh, if you use RxJS, you use schedulers anyway because they are baked in into RxJS. Let me give you some overview why this is important. As I said, schedulers are baked into RxJS. You could fix your slow running animations with it. You can also schedule tasks uh, as async events. And most of all, knowledge is powerful. These are some reasons why you should care about this talk at schedulers. Let's start with a question. What is the execution context of an observable? I asked this question on Twitter. About 500 people answered, and the most uh, voted answer was, what the fuck is execution context? If you look at the rest of the answers, you will see there is not a lot of difference. This is a proof that this question is really not easy to answer. and. Obviously, I will help to answer this today. If we look at this code, we see on the left side some lines. I use request animation frame, I use set timeout, I use a promise, and then a synchronous console log. And if you compare these lines with the, ref with the uh, other side, the console output, you realize that they occur in a different order, which means that if I wrap something in a set timeout and it is executed asynchronously, it will be executed after the synchronous code, for example. This is what I mean with execution context, so the context in which my console log, in this case, is executed. Let me add another line of code. Let me add this observable here, and if I subscribe to this observable, you will see that it is locked at the first place in the console part which means observables are synchronous, right? Not really, because, for example, I could apply a pipe that is called observe on, and I pass an async scheduler in, and then you will see that the same code is executed as it would be wrapped in a set timeout, so asynchronously. For most of us, this is kind of confusing, and I will give you more in-depth knowledge uh, what you can do with this, and hopefully it will unconfuse everything. My name is Michael. I do my living out of workshops, consulting, and I'm very active in the community. Um, what I do is I provide workshops and consulting over Angular Colleg platform. I run Angular Austria together with my colleagues. I guess some of them are here today. Is some of my colleagues from Angular Austria here. Miro is here, for example. Uh, Michael, not. OK, so I would expect two people here. There's only one other person, but OK. And then I also run Angular Vienna, which is one of the biggest meetups in Austria. And furthermore, I'm working on NG Spain together with my lovely colleagues, Anna and Sherry, and a lot of other people that are not here today. <coughs> but enough advertisement, let's talk about what's on the menu. I will show you the responsibilities of a scheduler, the basic usage, the different types of schedulers, the internal building blocks, so what's happening under the hood, and then I will show you how to use a scheduler manually. Let's start with the responsibilities. What is a scheduler? 
A scheduler is a piece of logic that helps you to parameterize where, when, and how code is executed. Let me divide it in three sections, in three blocks. The execution context, the execution policy, and of course the inner clock. And I will start with the execution context. So, execution context, as I showed you in my first uh, code example, is the way how code is executed. Is it executed asynchronously as a macro task or as a micro task? Is it running on an animation frame? And so on. And schedulers basically control the execution context of observables. Then, if you want to control execution context in Vanilla.js, you have to wrap your code into some function. If you compare this with uh, RxJS, it is obviously super convenient. You just provide another parameter, you just apply another pipe, and you can control or switch the execution context of your whole code without changing it, without wrapping it in another function. So really, really uh, cool to use. The execution policy controls the order in which the events are executed. And how to control order in JavaScript, we use arrays because arrays compared to an object has an order, right? If we look in the source code, we see that a scheduler internally holds uh, a variable called actions, which is an array of actions, and then a flush method, which basically runs all these actions in the right order. And the last part that I want to talk about is the clock. Schedulers help us to schedule some tasks at some point in time. And if you want to do something at some point in time, you need notion of time. Therefore, scheduler need some internal clock. How does this look uh, in the source code? A scheduler internally holds a function that is called now. And now returns you a number. Normally, it will return date.now, so the timestamp, but it can return any number, not even related to our real time. That's it. Now let me give you some examples how you can basically use schedulers in a simple way. <coughs> One way of using it is, as I showed you before, you can apply the observe on operator, and you can provide in this case, a queue scheduler. Observe on operators control the emission of events, and you can apply multiple of them in one stream. Another option would be subscribe on. Subscribe on is controlling the time when the subscription happens. And then you have furthermore options. You can also uh, provide schedulers and a delay on intervals, ranges, or whatever, and specify the execution context of this, for example, interval here. You already realized that there are different types of schedulers, so let me give you a quick overview of all the different types. There is the queue scheduler. The queue scheduler holds a queue of actions and schedule them one by one, synchronously. Then we have the async scheduler, which falls back to a macro task, so it's pretty similar as you would wrap your code in a set timeout or in a set interval. Then you have the as soon as possible scheduler, and this is the case, or is it is comparable if you would wrap your code in a promise. And in the end, you have the animation frame scheduler, and this scheduler schedules your actions right before the next paint event of the browser. There is a second group of schedulers. On the right side, you see virtual time scheduler. Virtual time scheduler eliminates time. So if you apply this scheduler, no matter how long your delay is, you will schedule all your actions in no time. And there is another special scheduler, there is the test scheduler. And the test scheduler is 
a helper for testing observables, for testing Rx. I gave you an overview of all the schedulers. Now let's use these schedulers in some code and let me give you some more insights uh, what you should care about. If you look at this code, I have two variables, a delay and observable, and then I subscribe multiple times to this observable, and every time when I subscribe, I use another scheduler. Animation frame scheduler, async scheduler, as soon as possible scheduler, and queue scheduler. <coughs> if you look at the console, you see what you would expect. That code is executed in the order as the execution context fires. The important part here is that I provided a delay of zero milliseconds because a delay is another optional parameter that you can use in your, for example, observe on <laughs> operator. Now let me change the code a little bit. What I did now is I only changed the delay from zero milliseconds to one millisecond. And if we take a look at the console now, we realize that all our console logs, no matter which scheduler is used, are executed as they would be wrapped in a set timeout. No matter which scheduler. What does it mean? It means that internally, Rx, or a scheduler in Rx, falls back to an async scheduler if you provide a delay. This is something that I had to explore painfully, and only after some reverse engineering, I realized the problem. I tweeted about this because um, as I was saying, I'm pretty sure if you're using animation frame scheduler, you're using it in the wrong way. Most of the people, and also I, used it like this. I create an interval, then I use 60 frames per second, and then I say I will run this interval on my animation frame scheduler, and I was expecting a smooth and clean animation because of the animation frame scheduler. In fact, this was not the case. So, if we take a look in the source code, we see that uh, animation frame scheduler, or action in this case, is extending a sync action, and if I provide a delay that is other than zero, it will automatically fall back to the async action. So there is no chance to use a scheduler with a delay uh, that is different from async. Let me give you some more example that we re really realize what it means for us. And therefore, I created this small demo that I will explain now. Perfect. So what is this? This is a small web component, and I have three circles. Uh, blue, green, and a red circle, and all the circles are animated over Rx. For the red circle, I used the Q scheduler. For the async scheduler, I chose the color green, and the blue circle is the animation frame scheduler. Then I have two values here. One value specifying the distance, how far the circles will jump on each animation. So if I increase this, opa, you see uh, they jump a bit further. If I increase or decrease the milliseconds, you see that the tick is different. Now let me decrease the milliseconds. to one millisecond. And now, please watch the blue circle when I switch from one millisecond to zero milliseconds, which is now. And now I switch back. And now back to zero milliseconds. So this is a visual proof that something is different if I provide zero milliseconds. In this case, I really run my blue animation on the animation frame scheduler, 
before with everything else than zero, it was not the animation frame scheduler. Let me give you another proof that this is really the animation frame that we are running on. To do this, I need to stress my browser. And when I was working on this demo, I spent hours to create some functions that put my browser under pressure. And after some hours of coding, it was not really working out for me well, I realized that a very easy way to stress my browser is if I just resize my window. So, <laughs> some hours wasted, now I know how to stress the browser. And if I stress the browser, uh, please watch the blue circle. It stays in its steady speed. It is a little bit flaky, but not too much compared to red and green. And if I stop the stress, red and green are jumping back to their as fast as possible speed, and the blue circle stays nearly in the same speed. So this is another proof that we can run smooth animations over the animation frame scheduler only if we apply a delay of zero milliseconds. Good. Let me switch back to the slides. Now let's dive deep into the source code. What is happening internally? I will talk about four building blocks. And I will explain a scheduler as something that schedules or executes work at a specific time in a, spe in a controlled execution context. And I can also unsubscribe from this scheduled work. Let me start with work. What is work? Work is just a function that gets executed. Nothing special, a work, uh, function that takes some parameter and then is doing something. In my case, I just console log uh, the state that I provide here. Next building block is an action. What is an action? Whenever I talk about actions, I explain them as the execution context of work. So work is wrapped in an action, and then I can call the schedule method on this action. This schedule method returns me a subscription, and as you know, I can use a subscription to later on unsubscribe from this code. What is the next building block? A subscription. Subscriptions are pretty familiar, familiar for us, uh, at least if we use our X. And if I subscribe on an observable, I get a subscription returned, and I can unsubscribe from this subscription later on. If I use a scheduler and call the schedule method, I also get a subscription returned, and I also can unsubscribe from it. Let me give you some more details on the subscription object. We could use it to nest subscriptions. How do we do this? In this case, I create I schedule an action, I create one subscription, I schedule another action, I create a second subscription, and then I use the subscriptions add method to nest a second subscription into it. And later on, I can call unsubscribe from my first subscription, and I will immediately unsubscribe from all nested subscriptions. This sounds like a pretty useless feature, right? But if you think about actions and that we could fan out actions, we could schedule actions within actions within actions, then finally it makes a lot of sense to have this method here. Because then we have a single point where we can control all our nested scheduled actions. Okay, we know what work is, we know what an action is, we know how a subscription works and that we can nest subscriptions. Let me show you how to use a scheduler. First, I show you how to get an instance, then I show you how to create, set up some work, and schedule this work. First, let me show you how to create an instance. You could use the new keyword, and you can create a new instance of the queue scheduler, for example, and you have to provide the class of queue actions, not an instance of these actions, but the class itself. I would not suggest you to do this, I would suggest you to use some predefined schedulers 
that you can use, use straight away that are provided from the library. Next, we need to set up delay, state, and work. Delay that specifies the delay, uh, some initial state, and some work that is executed. And then I can use my scheduler, and I can call the schedule method. And I will use work and state to create a new action. This action is later on executed after some delay. As I told you before, when I call the actions schedule method, I get a subscription returned. This subscription is forwarded to the scheduler's schedule method, and then the scheduler's schedule method returns me this subscription, and I can use this subscription to later on unsubscribe from it. This is more or less what happens inside of a scheduler, at least in RxJS6. Good. Now it's time for some more live demo. Okay, these are two signature pads. And if I use this device here, I call it finger, and I draw on my screen, you see that I can draw a line on this signature pad. The goal is to animate the drawing from the left side on the right side in real time with the specified delays and with all the breaks that I do. This uh, drawing, this signature, consists out, out of different things. A signature consists out of segments. What is a segment? This is a segment. This is a second segment. This is a third segment. And every segment consists, consists out of points. So if I take a look at my console logs, I can see that a point here, uh, let me quickly zoom in a little bit, that a point defines color, the time when the action of this point happened, and an X and Y coordinate to place it at some specific point on my drawing pad. And the goal is to iterate, <coughs> sorry, to iterate over all these segments and points and animate it on the right side. So let me jump into the code. Here I have my signature, I have a for each loop, and I iterate over each segment. And for each segment, I iterate over each point. And as a point has this time, I can calculate my delay at which time I should schedule or draw this point. I have an initial state, this is like at the beginning an empty signature, and then I need some work. So delay, state, and work. And then I can use my scheduler to schedule this work. So what I did previously, I was just console logging every point. What I will do now is I will take the initial signature, I will provide all my information, like the delay and everything, and then I will update my signature on the right side, on the second panel, drawing panel. And if I do this, and I draw something, and I click this Animate Real-Time button, you see that it draws in real time on the right side. Not only in real time, it is also including breaks. Now I did a break, and now I draw again something, and if I reschedule this, you also see that I include all the time in between my drawings, all the breaks. But what happens if I click this button multiple times very fast? Then you see that my animations overlap each other, and they are not really nice. So we should handle this. How could we handle this? Well, there is this subscription.add method that I explained to you and some time ago. And I could use this subscription's add method to fix this bug. So I have a drawing subscription here, which is just a new simple subscription. And then I can use the subscription's add method and as you know, if I call schedule, I return 
a subscription, and this subscription is now added to my drawing subscription. What else do I need to do? I need to reset or unsubscribe from this subscription whenever I reschedule a new animation. And this is done here, this reset subscription. Perfect. So now let's run the code again. I draw something. I click this Animate Real-Time button, and when I click it very fast, you see I don't mess up my animations anymore. I can really click it multiple times, and whenever I click it, it starts from scratch. Very good. What else can I show you? The next thing, let me quickly check, is the virtual time demo, for sure. So, back to this example, I have this animation, and I can draw a signature, I, I can animate everything, and on the right side, I always have to wait as long as my drawing took, as long as this time I have to wait to see the final result. What if I want to print the drawing? immediately and don't want to wait for so long. Then I could use virtual time scheduler to eliminate time. And there is a second button. This second button is called show immediately. And if I click this button, I provide true here. If I have true here, I use instead of the async scheduler, the virtual time scheduler. So this is the only change. Instead of this variable, I use this variable under scheduler, and then I can try to click my second button. So I draw something, animate real time will work, and if I click the show immediately button, nothing happens. Why is this the case? Well, as I showed you at the beginning, if I use virtual time scheduler, there's one more thing that I have to know. And this is whenever I say I'm done and now I want to run everything without no time, I have to call the flush method. And when I call the flush method, and I wait until this is redrawn, I can basically draw everything in zero time. So this is animated, and now I will clean it and click the show immediate button. And it shows without any animation. I did no changes in the code, nothing, but just providing another scheduler. I guess this is another very good example that shows how powerful these things in Rx are. Very good. Let's recap. What I showed you is an overview of our schedulers, what are schedulers, how can you use them, um, the different types of schedulers, a very important information. If you provide a delay, you will always fall back to the asynchronous, uh, to the, yeah, asynchronous scheduler. And then I also showed you how to use them manually to schedule some animations or whatever. Of course, there is a lot more. For example, I didn't introduce you into the test scheduler, but I have only 50 seconds left, so I guess that's not enough time to talk about this. That's basically it for my presentation today. As I told you, uh, everything that you saw here is reverse engineered. There is no documentation outside. So you can consider yourself now as an expert in RxJS schedulers. And what do you do if you are an expert in some technology? You go to your boss and ask for a salary raise. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your time. And I will use the last 40 seconds to tell you that I have this tradition, whenever something really special happens in my life, I shave a mustache. If you realized it, currently I'm wearing a mustache. This is because of this conference here. I'm super happy to be here. And just to give you an example that you can compare it with, the last time when I shaved myself a mustache was the wedding of my sister or the birth of my first nephew. 
So something really important. That's um, the last tiny bit of information for you, and <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Great. Track two is doing really well today. This is brilliant. It's good to see all these lovely faces in here. Um, welcome to the good, the bad, and the ugly component architecture at scale. Um, we have two brilliant speakers for you today. Um, Anna is an advocate and engineer at Ultimate Angular. She's also been named Women Tech Maker Lead by Google. She's the founder of Gals Tech, which is a group of women uh, in tech in Galicia, and an organizer of the GDG Vigo chapter. Sherry is a front end developer at Nordia Bank. She's also a co organizer of NG Vikings Conference, as well as some meetups in Copenhagen, where she's from. These two actually met in Angular Camp in 2017 and have become friends since. So good example of the Angular community bringing people together and becoming friends. So without further ado, please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Anna and Sherry. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for coming today. We're very excited to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about component architecture at scale. But just before we start, Sherry, why don't you give us a quick introduction about yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Sherry. Uh, yeah, we are super excited to be here today. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm working as a front-end developer at Nordia Bank in Copenhagen. I'm a woman tech maker lead, and I have a, a lot of passion for the community and have a tendency to make myself involved in a lot of community projects. So we are going to mention only two of them here. One is that I'm a proud organizer of NG Vikings, which is the result of collaboration among all the meetup organizers, Angular meetup organizers in the Nordics, uh, minus Iceland, even though that we have Magnus here, but he lives in Sweden, but plus Galicia in Spain. Uh, I'm also proud organizer of NG Spain as well, which Anna is going to talk about it shortly. Yeah, so I'm Anna, and I'm a developer avocado for Ultima Angular. And just like Sherry, I also get very involved in the community. And Sherry mentioned that NG Vikings is plus Galicia, that's me. And NG Spain is actually happening next year in June, so we're very excited to announce it. So stay tuned, because stuff is happening. And also, if you want stickers for NG Spain, NG Vikings, or Ultima Angular, just come see me or Sherry later, and we'll be happy to give them away. Now, I guess you're wondering, like, why are we giving talks together? Because we don't live in the same country, we don't work in the same company, so what's going on there? Sherry, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about us? Sure. I totally remember the day that we met. It was a sunny day, definitely not in Copenhagen, um, but in Spain at the uh, Angular camp, as uh, they mentioned, that we found out that we have a lot in common, even though that we live so far. Uh, and then we stay connected. And uh, everything happened at NG Vikings this year in, in Helsinki, um, that unfortunately, Shemola couldn't be there uh, for the NG girl, because she has an AG baby. And then we ended up uh, giving the introduction to Angular instead of her. And while working on that, we found that actually we can work really well together. So now everything, everything has started there. So that was a story. Uh, but Anna, I think you have a big announcement to make. Yeah, we do. So we are now the proud owners of Jurassic Park. We're really excited about this. However, there was a problem. It was too zoo concept-like for us. And we really didn't like this, did we? No, we didn't. So we came up with the idea to adopt all of these dinosaurs and taking care of them. Uh, but later, we realized that we seriously have no clue how to take care of dinosaurs. And we didn't want to be irresponsible parents. So we decided to actually build an application and then put all of these dinosaurs there for adoption instead. I guess it's a brilliant idea. And then we should start creating that here. Wait, wait, wait. Remember that Jurassic Park already has an application with all the dinosaurs and all the data that we need. So why don't we just reuse that? You have a fair point. That's a good idea. I really don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, but Anna, um, we really don't know that how this application is working. And if we go and then try to actually use this application, we have to maintain it. Should we start by looking at the code first? Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Let's go have a look. Yeah, let's go. 
Okay, that was really bad. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, like that architecture was no, way no, off. No, 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 no. But Sherry, why don't you tell us what is a bad architecture? Well, I can clearly explain it by what we saw there. So what we saw there, it was a, basically a spaghetti code mashed together, and then we even wanted to add a few uh, features there, it was totally not possible. So it was not a scalable at all. And maintainable, you really could not find out what is where. Everything was just basically one form. And no, it was not a good idea. And reliable, I, I'm not even sure that how that application is working. And definitely not reusable, Anna. Uh, so as I mentioned before, let's just start from scratch and then put all of those dinosaurs there for adoption. I agree that we should start from scratch, but you want to put all of the dinosaurs up for adoption? Yeah, what's the problem with that? You know there's like T-Rexes and some carnivorous ones that could actually eat us? Mm-hmm. Can, I mean, are you serious? They can come and eat us? Yeah. So I've actually taken care of them. Okay. And it's all good. So, okay. So, and but how? I, I just, don't worry. You know I love dinosaurs too. I wouldn't hurt them. Okay. Okay. But, and I spoke to the herbivor herbivorous ones and they, those are the vegan ones like you, mm -hmm. and they actually um, were really, really excited about having this application. So they already built it. It's done. I mean, in last few minutes, yeah, yeah. they just beat an application. Go show them. Go on. Actually, actually, it looks good. I mean... See, they did it. It's all done. Okay, that's great. But it's still, do you guarantee that they are not the same dinosaurs that they built the application before? I mean, sounds fishy, few minutes. Yeah, I think you have a point. We should definitely check to see if it is scalable, maintainable, reliable, and reusable. But just before we dive into it, how about we tell our audience what they're going to be learning today? Sure. So what we are going to do, we are going to find out that how we split down an application into a smaller section, which are components. Then we're going to see what small and dumb components are. And then we are going to have an overview of how NG content can help you. And last but not least, we're going to see how components can communicate with one another. So let's go check out these components. Yeah, I guess they are somewhere in the, in the forest, so we have to go with yeah. our car there. Yeah, let's go, go find this component. Yeah, OK. So, OK, okay yeah, this is, we saw how it is, but let's look at the code. Oh, no. Can you see what I see? Yeah, let's take a closer look. Yeah. So what we have here is a direct HTTP call from our component. I mean, that's not good. No. Yeah. We, we don't approve. We do not approve it at all. No, 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 no. Okay. Why? So we don't approve because we had way too much logic in that component for that component to hold. The, we need to separate it and break it down more. And when we're talking about separating, we need to think about the separation of concerns. And here we have a direct HTTP call from a component, and that shouldn't be happening. Also, we need to make sure that that component takes care of its own logic, so it has single responsibility. And yeah, now that we know why this isn't a good example, can you show us how we can actually save this component? Uh, sure. Uh, we actually can use services. And uh, what you need to do is that you need to extract what you saw that, for example, that all logic related to how to communicate or with the, or with the backend, extract it from the component, and then put it in a service. And then later on, you can inject that service in any component that you want to, and then try it, and then call it there. So in this way, you can even inject it in many more components. So you write it once, and then reuse it later. So let's see how we created that. So we basically created a service, and then we extracted those logic here, and then we created a method called getDinosaurs. And then inside our component, this time, we first imported it, and then we injected it into our constructor, and then we just called it and then used it. So, oh. Ah! What, what was, was that? that, Anna? You know it. Yeah, I do. You know I said I took care of the T-Rexes? Yeah. Well, they were really angry, so I just had to like open the cage and run away. Why? You just explain me that they are the one that they can eat. Anna. We've got to run. Yeah, yeah. run. Yeah, okay. run, 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 run. Let's go to the next place and... Oh, okay. This looks pretty good. Yeah, this is like a detail page, so... Yeah. But let's check the code. Yeah, let's do that. 
Okay, so. This is just like the first application we saw. So yeah. we have everything in one place. We don't have any sort of, well, they did make one component, right? Yeah, they just mm -hmm. heard that they should use component. Mm. So they just put everything here. I cannot imagine that how they, oh my God, so. Yeah, it doesn't even fit on the screen. No, like, not at all. So it's like really yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah. So that is. So we we definitely we definitely do not, do not approve it. No, 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 no. Okay. So why can't we approve it, Sherry? So it's basically the same concept that you put too much of logic in one place, and then you totally forget about the separation of concern and then single responsibility. So that's not good. Mm. So how can we save it? How can we improve it? Well, as you know, Angular allows us to use this component-based architecture. And component-based architecture allows us to divide the user interface into smaller sections or widgets called components. Now, a really good practice is to, even before you start coding, to actually get the mock-up and start drawing rectangles around it, which you will divide as components. And you can already start deciding what's going to be your parent component, what's going to be your child component. And that way, you can also start structuring your application. And you can do, well, we already did that. So this is what we did, and this is our way of structuring it. It's not always the best way, because it depends on the application. But it's a good start. Yeah, but it's a good start. Can you take we it can, a bit deeper? Yeah, we can, we can look at one of the components that we created, which is, the, which is the, the product. So in this product, while we are adopting a dinosaur, you can also go ahead and then buy some product that, that dinosaur like it. And uh, so let's see how we did that. So what we created, it was a specific product component, and then we passed two input there. These are the data that they receive. So one is about the list of products, and then the other one is about the dinosaur's habit, which means that the product that they like or they don't like. And, uh, and then because they can buy it, so they need to have a kind of a way to uh, communicate outside of the, uh, that component. So we have an output for buy. And then look at here, so we only, we only put the, all the logic that we need inside this, this component here. And then we ignore the rest, I mean, because the rest, they are in the different uh, components. So everything is nice and clean, and then that component, actually, the HTML is pretty simple here. And in this way, if tomorrow there is a problem with the, with the product, you know which file to open. You don't need to go ahead or control shift f to find the thing that you want. So you open the file that you, you need. So I would say that We're good. we are good. Yeah, but Shari, lately I've been hearing a lot about smart and dumb components. So can you explain? Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, we can categorize our components into two types. Stateful components, or smart one, are stateless component, or the dumb one. Uh, stateful components are the one that they, they care about the, the kind of the business logic. So the, everything in all the business logic that we have there, they are normally tied to a specific user story. And they also the one that they care about uh, the how to communicate with the backend, for example, and get the data. So these are not normally the, uh, the type of component that they are the best candidate to be reusable. And the stateless one, they are the one that they literally don't care. Uh, they just get the data from wherever, normally from the parent, and then they just display in the way that they want to. So these are the best components, best candidates to be the uh, reusable one. Okay, in our story, what we did, we make one stateful component, and this is the one that we also injected the service there. So they, we got the data that we want, and the rest of our component, in this way, they are stateless. That product, today we can pass the data for the dinosaurs, tomorrow we can pass the data about dogs, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess uh, we are good. Yeah, let's run off to the yeah. next component. Let's go. Let's go check it out. Yeah. Okay, that looks pretty. Yeah, but let's look at the code. Yeah. No way. So there's basically a copy and paste yeah. with just the change of header. So this would yeah. be like, do you know what this would be like? What? It would be like having two sherries. Oh, okay. Yeah. But with this different names. Hmm. And that's that unique. Yeah, and we don't need two sherries. Like, no, no, no. Yeah. One is enough, one is enough. Definitely. Okay, so we do not approve. No, not at all. So, Sherry, why do we not approve? 
Um, I mean, you just saw that here, these dinosaurs, they thought they are too smart. Uh, they, they saw a lot of similarity into two forms, and then copy and paste, and they just change something there. So in this way, you're basically repeating yourself, and you really don't want to repeat yourself. I, I noticed in that component there was a kind of a type of food, and if you want to add a couple of things more to that, that section, you have to do it in two places. So you have to maintain this in two places as well. And as, as the product grows, so this can easily go out of the hand. So this is not good. And testing is the same thing, but two times, and it's not too smart. And as I mentioned, it's also not maintainable. So, Anna, how we can improve? Well, in this scenario, we can use ng content. Now, I don't know if you remember that in AngularJS, we had transclusion, and in web components, we have slots. Well, this is the same thing. And ng content acts as a placeholder within your code, which you can then reuse later. So what we did with these forms is we put one form, we didn't have two forms, we have one form with the same content, and the places where we needed the change, which were two places, one was the header and one was the button, we added the ng content tags. And what we do here is we add a select attribute because we have more than one piece of, or element that will change its data. And when you add the select attribute, you have to tell it which element you're focusing on. In this case, it was the H3. And later on, we had the button. Now, how do we pass data or whatever we need to to this ng content tag? What we do is we add our component. In our case, we did it in the app component file. And we add the elements that we need to change. In this case, the H3 and the button. And then we just pass whatever we need to there. This is a pretty simple example. But it can get more complex. You can add another component inside or whatever you may need to. So I think that component's done with. Yeah, it's totally good. Yeah. So. Um, up to here, we found out that how we split our application into a component, and then how we make it flexible by using ng content. But Anna, how can these components talk to each other, communicate with each other? Well, the best practice is one-way data flow. Normally, we would have a stateful component which passes its data down to its um, children components, or stateless components. And if there was an event to occur, um, that event would then be passed up to a stateful component and then be handled. Let's take a look at an example. Now, say that the right-hand child component decided to have a change, an event change, for example, a button click or some input or whatever. That event would then be passed up to its parent component, which would then be passed onto the stateful component, which would handle that event and pass back down the data that was necessary. This is really good for debugging, because you know exactly what's going on. But imagine if you had an example like this. Like, we're going to have the same thing happen. So we have an event happen, and all of these things change. I don't know about you, but I would hate to debug this. And I wouldn't even want to look at the code. So we just want to have a friendly reminder that events up and data down. OK, so this is a very simple scenario that I showed you. But imagine if things got more complex. Shuri, what could we do there? Yeah, I can explain it with what happened to us. These dinosaurs, they came to us, and they asked for a new product, which is pension product. Because uh, they said that, what happened to us when we get old? I said, that, OK, we can, we can fix it. And we started to, to, to build some pension product for them. But then soon we realized that each dinosaur get adopted in different countries. And these countries, each of them, they have their own pension rules. And then we started to build components, components, and then we realized it, to implement all of this logic, we ended up having form that it was a toggle in some part of the form. And it's going to change the whole state of the form because of, uh, because of the business uh, logic behind it. So we ended up in a nested, nested, nested world. And uh, we just said that, OK, we can handle it, because we know that as soon as we stick to the flow, which is input um, done and event off, we can eventually go ahead. So this is a good practice. It's OK. But we realized that actually our 
our application it was so slow because of those nested nested components that they want to talk to each other and by going uh, having all of these med middle layers especially those toggles that is change something over there so it made everything slow and even though that it was we thought that it's going to be easy to debug but no way in that nested world we could not fix it so uh, what I talk basically was that, for example, in the component tree, that you have a toggle in the, in the A, and that is going to change the one in B. And we could not handle it. So, do you have any solution for that? Because I know you have all the answers. I wish. OK, so it really depends on the scenario and the application. But a good starting point would be going back to ng content. Now, before we described how it can make a component flexible, but it can also help when it comes to um, flattening the component tree. So say we take our example from before, where we had those two forms instead of one. What we could do is just make the one form instead of having two. and we would actually have one layer less on the component tree. And this would increase performance, because we wouldn't be having so much change detection going on and so much inputs and outputs. So that is one approach. What would be another approach, Sherry? Um, the, the other approach is that to use behavior subject. Uh, what is unique about them, that they are observers, that they can be observed. And, and also, the cool thing about them, that no matter that, when you subscribe to it, it's going to give you the current state. So even if you subscribe it late, you still will get the current state. So oh, what we decided to add to our application was that a happiness indicator. So as more product that the dinosaur likes, that the happiness increase or decrease. Um, so you can say that the product component is going to be totally tied to the other component upstairs. So uh, what we did, we created a service and we put that uh, behavior subject there. And then the component A and B, they both in, we injected it there. And then as soon as, so in this way, they both they can talk directly to this service. And then both of them, they can get the current state. So even if for another feature that the dinosaurs, they ask us, so we are going to add a new component, that component can also get the current state. So you can have as many as behavior subject as you want in your component, in, in your application, uh, and it's going to help you, and it's a good practice, no, no worry about it. Uh, but later we realized it that for that pension form, it was not enough. No, it wasn't. So the, the other approach we have is actually state management. And this way, we can hold all of the state in one place, unlike behavior subject, where we have the state in several places within the application. So what I mean by this is that we will have the service that will in, um, pass the data onto our store, which will handle the state, and then pass it down to the stateful components and the child components. And again, say the right-hand child had an event that would pass it up to its parent component, which would then pass it onto the service, which would handle this event and pass it back to the store. And that store would handle it so that we with the help of selectors, we can actually send down the data that we need to only to the components that we need to. This is a really cool thing about state management. But the thing is, it's become really trendy, and everyone seems to be using it, even when they don't need to. So we really want to emphasize on the fact that you should only use state management if it's necessary. And if you want to know when you can use it, there's actually a really good talk after lunch by Mike Ryan. You might not need NGRX. Yeah, I, I personally want to invite you all there because he's talking about Sherry parent principles. It spells different, but he pronounced it the same. So go and watch his talk. Yeah. So up to here, we found that if you use ng content, you may be able to remove some of the unnecessary layers. With behavior subject, you can have a message bus pattern. And then if you want to keep all the states in, a, in a one place, you can use a state management. OK, I think we're done. Yeah, we are done. Yeah. But Sherry, what does the future hold for us? Yeah. 
looks so nice. Uh, well, um, there is one thing that we created all of these components and we made them communicate with each other, but we can go one step farther and then use web components, which is actually our favorite topic. Yeah. We can talk about it forever, but we are not going to do it now. No, we so, have yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so what we, we can do about web components that, I mean, web components are using browsers capability. I pronounced it wrong. Yeah. 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 It's OK. So, <laughs> so, so because of that, we can actually few, few, uh, we can write, write fewer line of code, um, but, uh, but we, we can gain the performance because we are using that what browser is doing. So we can take, for example, take advantage of change detection in the browser. So it will bring us a lot of, uh, a lot of features, including being platform agnostic. So you can actually share your components with the, in the open source world, and no matter that who is using what, um, what framework, they can use it. And even if you want to have a migration plan to some other frameworks, or even from AngularJS to Angular, you can also help it. And then now with the Angular element, we can also use it. So go ahead and, and, um, and read about it, or you can come later and talk to us. We can, we can talk. So is it the time to talk about the ugly part? Yeah, so um, even though we try to make our code perfect and our architecture spot on, there's always going to be 20% of that code that we hate and that is really horrible. And that's OK. It happens to all of us. But make sure that the 80% is spot on and you're good to go. Like, there isn't a one solution fits all when it comes to architecture. It really depends on what application you're building and also if it's like form driven or data driven or for the native world. It will really depend. But um, we want to say that even if you think that your application isn't going to scale, always prepare it for it to be scaled from day one because it probably will scale. And if it doesn't, well, at least you have a neat and tidy code base. And a piece of advice, we want to say we've insisted that you need to break down import, um, components, but make sure you don't break them down too small. Like, there are limits. So not too big and not too small. Find a like medium. Also, keep it simple and keep them stupid. Do not over-engineer your application. It's not necessary. It just makes it too complex. And also, make sure that your components are testable. Now, as we're finishing, we would just like to say a massive thank you to Todd, Mike, Brett, Quinton, Manfred, Chris, and again, Mike, but the other Mike. Actually, Mike. Because without them, this talk wouldn't have happened, and we're very grateful for all of their help. And also, a big thanks to Sherry's dog, who appears in that, for all of the mental support he gave us during the photo shooting. So thanks to Lance. And thank you all for being here. I know that you're hungry. You want to run to the launch. But before that, uh, we have something. We promised to say that who is our favorite dinosaur. And it's actually Lasky. And thanks to Angular Connect, I actually got the name Taga. So you can follow us on Twitter. We are going to share the slide. And then you can also come to talk to us. And yeah, see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, quickly, before you all head off, a couple of um, important announcements. Tomorrow afternoon, we get all the uh, core Google Angular team together uh, up on stage. And it's an opportunity for you to all ask them questions and for them to answer it. So if you head on over to Slido and use the event code Angular Connect, you can start putting your questions up now. And they'll go through to the Angular team. Uh, secondly, this lunchtime, we have the community lunch on over in the office hours room. If you're currently a conference organizer or a meetup organizer, you might be interested to check it out. If you're not and you're just interested in being more involved in the community or just want to overhear some conversation or be part of some conversation about the community at Angular, you can go and do that as well. You don't have to be a meetup organizer to participate. That's over in the office hours room. Thank you very much.
Are y'all ready? Yeah. Well, now that was lame. Come on, try again. Are you ready? Yeah. Woo! Okay, we have a few words from Stan Amira, and here we go. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> hey, how are you? All right, it's been a great conference so far, and I was supposed to give a sponsor talk for the company that I work for, Progress. We have a booth out there. You can go talk to us. But I decided to do something else, actually. And this is not a fancy background here. Uh, it's actually a painting by the American abstract painter, Jackson Pollock. It was drawn 70 years ago. And I was kind of wondering, what would be the name of this painting if Jackson Pollock were to draw it today? I have no idea, but here's what I came up with. Like, this is our life in 2018. It's so hard to choose the right thing to do. And what I think is that there is no single best programming language. It's always what works for you, what's the best for your project. Also, there is no single best framework. We should choose whatever suits our project, our team, whatever we want to learn, right? Also, there is no single best way to indent our code. I mean, come on, should be just two spaces. Anyway, right? Okay. So my name is Tanimira Vlaeva. I am just a developer at Progress. And I'm not here to tell you what's the best thing to use. I'm just going to share my opinion. I'm part of the native script team for more than two years. And I'm going to say what are my reasons to keep on working there. So we're going to talk about the best framework ever. That's native script. And the reasons why I like it is that you build mobile apps, but you use JavaScript, the language for the browser, so you can reuse your web development skills. We also have integration with Angular and Vue. Oh, did they say Vue here? OK, I never mind that. So we have integration with Vue and Angular. So you can reuse your web code, your web application code, to build a mobile application. Also, we have 100% native API access, hence the name native script. And the important thing here is that Android and iOS have been out there for over a decade. There are tons of plugins and libraries built for these platforms. You can use all of them through JavaScript with native script. Also, we are open source and free to use. You can build your apps. You can fork native script. You can build a better native script. It won't be too hard, probably. So just to recap, because it's JavaScript, you can reuse your existing skills. You don't have to learn Objective-C or Swift or Kotlin or Java. Oh. <laughs> also, because we have integration with the most famous web frameworks, you can reuse your web code and have a single project and multiple apps for mobile and for web. You can use tons of native plugins that are already available. You don't have to build wrappers. You don't have to think, oh, how do I access the camera or how do I use uh, augmented reality in my app? You can just use it from JavaScript. And the last thing, which is the most important for me, is that we have a great community. Because we are open source, people file us tons of issues every day. Great. They also fix our code and are eager to help anyone who has questions about native script. All right, so I have a session at 7 something somewhere, a whitening session. And I'm going to show you how you can add native script to your existing web projects. So if you're more interested, you can come and watch me. And if you want to try native script, go to that address. You don't need any setup. You can just play around with it and give us some feedback. We will be out there on the boat. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. That was great. Thank you so much. OK, I want to tell you our next speaker uh, is really cool, and it's a topic that's kind of close to my heart. Are you com you, you got to come up and uh, put your laptop up? Come on, come on. Oh, well, you're ready to go then. Come in quickly. Over quickly. You 
talk about me and then I'll talk. Okay. I just met him this morning and I already love him. You guys, I want to hear a, a big round of applause for Craig Spence. Computers, cool. All right. So, universally speaking, hi. I'm Craig. You can find me on Twitter, you can find me on GitHub. I wouldn't bother, but you can if you want. I'm from Wellington in New Zealand, um, so I've come a pretty long way to be here. And I'm really, really excited to be here in London at Angular Connect. Oh, let me just fix my screens. Sorry. Let's do that. Cool. Much better. <laughs> um, this is a deep dive. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about Angular Universal, um, and I'm working off a few assumptions. So I'm going to guess that because you're here, you know some Angular. And I'm hoping that also because you're here, you've actually heard of Angular Universal in some way. And today we're going to cover a few things. Oh, I'm going to do this one. So what problems does Angular Universal solve, and how it solves them? Then we're going to look at some um, pretty common uh, patterns that we can use to make our applications work with Universal. And then we're going to look at a couple of reasons why you might not want to use Universal. So I've got a tra company called TradeMe, um, and we're New Zealand's biggest website. We're kind of like eBay. Um, we do auctions, classifieds, e-commerce, stuff like that. We've been around since 1999. Got about 650 people working with us. 100 of them are um, developers. To give you kind of an idea of the scale that we work at, um, the New Zealand population is about 4.9 million people, and we've got about 4.5 million accounts. So it's pretty saturated. Currently, we have um, two main sites in production. This is the classic TradeMe site, which has existed since about 1999. Um, it's a server-rendered .NET um, application. And we also have this one, which we call TradeMe Touch. Um, it's a client-rendered backbone application. Uh, started around 2012. So for the last few years, my team has been working to create our new web experience, I'm combining both of these sites into one nice, responsive, API-driven application. And when we started um, building this app in about 2014, um, we called it Friend, by the way, short for front end. Um, the obvious choice was to use AngularJS. Um, and we worked away at that for a couple of years, building out kind of the architecture and the functionality. But by mid-2016, uh, we knew we had some problems. So we're starting out trying to replace our mobile website, but we were just really struggling to get the performance that we needed. We had too much DOM, we had too much JavaScript, we had too many watches, uh, and it was just not fast. So we said goodbye to AngularJS, and we rewrote our whole application in Angular. So if we fast forward a little bit to the middle of this year, and we've rebuilt a whole site in Angular, Fully rebuilt, it's great. To give you a kind of idea of the size of it, there's 682 NG modules right now. Um, I don't actually know how big that is. If you want to talk to me about the size of your app later, I'd be really keen to know. But it's big enough for us. We're currently rolling it out to our mobile users. It's making money. There's still too much JavaScript. Um, but it's not slow. It's not, not really doing anything too terribly right now. So I want to talk about how Angular works a little bit in terms of network traffic. So you've got your device, and a user requests uh, a page on the application, in this case for a listing on TradeMe with a particular ID. The server then responds with a bunch of static HTML in the index.html file, which contains some references to some static resources, so your CSS and your JavaScript. And then we also have our like, application component, along with some sort of generic loading state in the middle of that. So a device kind of grabs that HTML, passes all of it, and starts rendering the page, and then it makes some requests for like those static resources, which the server then responds with. So we'll get back some JavaScript and some CSS, that kind of thing. Then Angular boots up after we've passed all that CSS and all that JavaScript, and that can take quite a long time on a mobile device. At that point, we can then start making some API requests, you know, getting down the data for that listing, or the category tree that we have on our site, and the server responds with that. 
At that point, we've kind of got the app and everything we need to render um, the whole application to our users. But there's quite a bit of back and forth. So it would be really, really cool if there was some way that we could reduce that number of round trips. Oh. So, Angular Universal. Let's have a look at how that same flow would work in a universal application. So again, a user makes a request for the listing ID, for the listing with the ID. But this time, instead of the server just responding with a static file, we boot up Angular on the server. It generates the full content of that whole first page of the application and gives us an entire HTML document, including all the inline styles that we need to render the full page. So the device can then instantly render real application content instead of just some loading state. And you can even configure Angular Universal to include some data that you requested on the server and pass it to the client. At that point, Angular then boots up again on the device and rehydrates the application, which replaces the server-generated HTML. So why would you do this? Number one, performance. People kind of talk about that a bit um, with Angular Universal. There can definitely be some performance wins. In addition to that, there are huge benefits in terms of SEO, and we can get some bonus uh, social rendered content, which can be really useful too. So like I said, there are some big potential wins with universal performance, but there's actually also some risks. So first of all, Angular Universal gets useful content to the user faster, which means that that first paint or first render can be pretty good, um, and that's pretty important on a mobile device. It also means that sometimes you can kind of get some initial resource discovery, like images that you might have to pull down, or fonts and stuff like that. The trade-off, though, is that you're now processing on the server, which means that you can have a slower time to first byte, and you can end up with like a white screen at the start of your application for a bit. But thankfully, um, you know, we can do caching. We can cache on the server, or we can cache on the service worker, um, and we can make most of that processing time vanish. There also happens to well, there tends to be a slower time to interactive, and that's because you're rendering the whole app on the client, then rehydrating your Angular app over top of that. But as with everything, you need to measure it and experiment around and see what works with your application, and you can get some wins there. Then we have SEO and working in non-JavaScript environments. This is actually the main reason that TradeMe went down the universal uh, path. What it allows you to do is it allows search engines to crawl your website. Um, and that's whether or not they have JavaScript capabilities. And we don't know if all the different engines really do. This can be a really big win if you're competing against other websites, um, particularly on the same keywords, where you want to be higher up the rankings and search results. Um, there's a really good talk that Igor gave at ng-conf um, earlier in the year where they talked about not server-side um, SEO and how they work. So if you want to check out more about that, I'd see this talk. And as a kind of side benefit to this, um, rendering your site on the server means that your content um, can be seen by people who have JavaScript turned off, so, um, and, and also old devices um, that don't support all the JavaScript that you're trying to use. And in addition to those performance gains and the SEO wins, um, Angular Universal lets you do pre-rendering for other platforms, so for example, uh, Facebook or Twitter, where you can get these nicely rendered um, social previews for your application. That's a, a real thing that was on sale on TradeMe. It's pretty cool. That's dupe, apparently, whatever that means. So where are we today with Friend? So we've got Angular Universal in production. It's making even more money, which is obviously a good thing. There's still too much JavaScript, but I promise you we're working on it. But most importantly, we've got server-driven SEO, social previews, and we're continuing to get even better and better performance. That's all pretty neat. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the most thematically confusing slide of my entire talk. And I want to explain a bit. <laughs> so I know that Angular Connect has got a dinosaur theme this year, um, but my talk submission was about space, whatever. And it happens to be named after my favorite, a song by my favorite dinosaurs, um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I tried to figure out how to merge a space theme with some dinosaurs. Um, it was pretty interesting. And what I came up with was asteroids. So here's some facts about asteroids. They're categorized as minor planets. Um, they're not comets or meteoroids. They're different. 
There's a whole bunch of them around Earth, almost 15,000 of them. They have really, really cool names like Odysseus and James Bond, and they allegedly killed the dinosaurs. What so happens is that there's this pretty cool website called Asterink, made by a guy called Ian Webster. It's an AngularJS application, and it allows you to search and visualize um, the various asteroids and where they live in our solar system. So we're going to have a go at rebuilding an Angular and getting it working with Universal in the next 20 minutes, apparently. So of course, we can start with the Angular CLI. And with these four simple instructions, um, you can actually get a working version of the vanilla Angular CLI application up and running. And that looks something like this. Cool. So. Uh, So there's a few changes that happen from a vanilla CLI application. First off, we get a few new dependencies. So we got Platform Browser, um, Express, NG Universal Module Map NG Factor Reloader, which is a great name. Um, we have this whole new server file that gets generated. This is our actual um, server for the files. This is what does the universal part. We've got a couple of changes to a vanilla app module. You can see here this with server transition function. Um, we give it an app ID and that hooks them up between the two platforms. We also have to modify the main TS file so that we're only happening, our bootstrap is only happening after the DOM content loaded event. This is one of the things that can impact that um, first time to interactive. We also have an entry point for our, um, for our main server and a whole new app server module. So the app server module is the thing that wraps around our app module and it allows us to kind of abstract away some of the application from the functionality we want on the server. So if this is running, it's also really damn quick. So if we come in here and we can look, uh, once again, we see we've actually got nice server rendered HTML content from the, um, from the universal server, which is pretty sweet. And if I do like one of these, it's like, couple hundred milliseconds, which is pretty great. So I can't really talk about um, Angular Universal without talking about Node a little bit, um, but that could obviously be like an entire talk. Um, so just a few quick things if you don't know what it is. So, so JavaScript runtime um, without any DOM. It's um, <laughs> driven by Chrome's V8 engine, um, so that's what's powering it under the hood. And if you've used anything with NPM, if you use the Angular CLI, then you've definitely played with Node before. So this is the code that um, the Angular CLI generates for us. Um, this is a framework called Express, if you've heard of that before. And we start off by making this new application. After that, we require some things from our built universal application. So we've got that app server module ng factory thing and that lazy, lazy module map, which hooks up our lazy loaded routes. Then we init the ng express engine. This is only one of the engines you can use. There's a whole bunch of different other frameworks, but the CLI is really good for this stuff. Um, you can also pass the, then we set up a handler, sorry, that takes all the requests that come into our server and pass them through to the universal engine. And then we start the server on a particular port. So this is pretty much all we need for our server right now, um, but it can and almost definitely will get a whole bunch more complicated if you uh, get this into a production ready environment. So now I just want you to all imagine some time passing, and this is me working away building like the client version of uh, the suite app we're going to build. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, that one. Cool. So um, what do we got here? Um, this is kind of the based off the generic uh, Angular CLI application we built. Got some drop downs that let us pick how many um, asteroids we can see. Got this pretty cool WebGL little render going on that I totally stole from the other website. Um, and um, also importantly, we're using NGRX. Um, so NGRX including the uh, router state module and also entity. So you change, change the selects, um, route params update, and we render some new data. So let's see if we can do this one get all the most accessible asteroids around, around the planet Earth, which is pretty neat. Uh, so 
Unfortunately, this doesn't work um, on the server. And so if I come in here and I run npm run again, blah, everything blows up. Um, we get sweet window is not defined, which is something that you'll probably become pretty familiar with if you do any universal stuff. Um, so that's not good. So we then have a question, which is, how do we run this on the server? Oh, OK. <laughs> so Angular Universal. Um, the name kind of implies that you could maybe run things anywhere. And that's actually true. So within Angular, there's a whole bunch of different platforms you can run um, your code on. And I think it's really important that we don't forget about web workers, only because we wouldn't want to prevent our application from being able to run in that environment or in any other environment that might come along in the future. So I think we should stop thinking about like browser versus server and think more about DOM versus no DOM. So the question really becomes, how do you run this anywhere? There are pretty much four different patterns that I've come across in terms of how we actually want to build things to make them work with Universal. So we can talk about having one implementation that runs in all of the environments. We can have one implementation that just runs in a specific environment. We sometimes want to have different implementations that run in each of the different environments. And sometimes we want to have entirely different functionality for each place that our code will run. So the first one, this is the kind of most straightforward, and it's what you should probably aim for most of the time, which is using exactly the same code in any environment that's running. And what it mostly comes down to is just avoiding the DOM. So the DOM is the document object model. It lives in our browsers. It doesn't live in Node. And when we try to use it, we get those windows, not defined errors, and other associated errors. The good thing is that there's almost always a way to get Angular to work without directly accessing the DOM. And if you've ever looked at native element and the Angular docs, hopefully you've seen the big red use with caution, and I would really encourage you to consider that. In general, your components are pretty much just going to work over all your environments, provided that you're using all the abstractions that Angular gives us. So inputs and outputs, ng style, ng class, all those things are obviously supported across all the different platforms. But you might occasionally need to reach for the renderer. So this is just a thing that we can inject. Um, it's your normal interdependency injection, and it gives us a mechanism for using some of those um, kind of DOM APIs. If you're using a component library um, or building a component library yourself, it's really important to make sure that's working with Universal. We found that doing it with our component library made it a lot easier to build up a whole app working with Universal. Obviously, real applications, sometimes you're just going to have to use these APIs. And then there are a few approaches that you can take. My main advice, though, would just to be explicit about everything and to be defensive. So, we have quite a few services that look a little bit like this. Um, this is our window ref, and it has a really handy function called use window on it, which basically will only run code if the window is available. But also, we make sure that we have an explicit null type so that if you're running in a place, you're running a code, and you don't inherently handle the case when you return a null, your code's probably not going to compile. And we've found this pattern works pretty well. A way to kind of extend that is that you can provide an alternative. And so more custom services that wrap around these DOM APIs. For example, this location service. Here we're using an optional injection token, which means that if the URL location token is provided, we'll always use that. And if it's not, we'll fall back to using the actual DOM. So that means that on the server, you would use that alternative implementation, and most of your code just remains the same. Sometimes you just need to hack it. So there's a whole bunch of third-party code out there that just doesn't work well. Um, three trackball controls is one of them. And you end up doing stuff like this, which is pretty gnarly. Um, you can just look directly and see if window is defined and do some stuff if you need to make it work. But make sure you clean up after yourself, because these kind of things definitely come back to bite you later. And if all else fails, you can check the platform. Um, this is one of my favorite GitHub comments. Great, Jeff Welpley. Just, no! Um, it's a pretty bad idea to use these in general, I found. Um, it's not really that explicit. Um, but sometimes, as a last resort, it can be necessary. So if you really, really need to do it, it's another injectable thing, the platform ID. 
and then we have a whole bunch of these methods as platform browser, as platform server, that you can use to turn on and off functionality. So luckily, our app only needs a couple of these changes because I'm great. Um, we've had to manipulate um, this component, and instead of just doing native element dot append child with a canvas, we're using the renderer API instead. And also, we've added a sweet hack wrapping around trackball controls, which means that it has a window when it needs it, and it works as usual. So if I run again, server around the CSR. Oh, sorry, got to kill that one. And our server actually starts up this time, which is pretty good. But if I come back here and make a request, uh, we can see, oh no, document is not defined. Yep, oh, sorry. Cool. So this here, document is not defined. Same kind of error as before. But as you can see, we actually did, did get an application kind of rendered, and it did the things that we might expect eventually. But also, we had that error, which isn't great. Another thing that we tend to do is having to have just one implementation that runs in a specific environment. So our WebGL um, visualization, we know it's never, ever, ever going to work on the server without a bunch of work. Um, we just want that to run in the browser. And one way to do this is literally to just turn it off. So again, we use optional injection um, annotation. And just have an if statement. It's really basically a really cheap like, feature flag. But it kind of does the trick. In a, in a real world application, this might mean things like turning off analytics when they run on the server, or you know, turning off iframe rendered ads, whatever it is. And like I said, in our application, we're just going to turn off the WebGL. And we can do that by using our app server module. So we have this module that wraps our app module. And in here, we can just provide new values and overwrite things. So we have the token for the visualization service, and we just give it null. And so when it runs on the server, this token doesn't exist, and therefore the code doesn't run. And I can show you what that looks like, too. So again, we've just got this optional injection token, uh, wrapping all of our code in a sweet if statement and providing that null value over top of it. And so this time, when we run, server spins up, and we render our page, we get no server errors, which is cool, and we get our application, which is pretty great. But there's still more we can do there. So this third pattern is kind of just the way that Angular Universal works. So we can provide different implementations of a specific interface that only runs in each environment and just change how they work under the hood, kind of like a strategy pattern. If we look at our app module TS file and our app server module TS, we can see this working. So in the app module TS, we import the browser module with our server transition. This imports the browser implementation of the renderer and the HTTP client. But in the app server module TS file, we instead import the server module. If you dig into the source code for the server module, we can see that under the hood, they are importing um, a new server implementation for the renderer and a new server implementation for the HTTP client. And that makes them work with the node environment. Um, we can do this in our own applications. If you're doing something like handling cookies, you need to treat them differently on um, different environments. Or things like local storage, you might want to have similar ideas going on there. And lastly, there are some cases where we just want to do something entirely different on in different environments. And so we can use this pattern to optimize our application just a little bit more and get a really, really great universal implementation. So if I quickly go back to our demo and I look at the network tab, this pesky little thing here is a duplicated API request. And that happens because our whole application runs twice, once on the server and then once on the client. We already make the request from the server. We don't want to make it again on the client. So yeah, the call to get the asteroid data, it happens, it happens twice. This kind of makes the initial render a bit useless, and it's kind of a performance killer. So we want to avoid it if we can. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, Angular provides a, a state transfer mechanism. And what that does is it allows us to send specific data from the server to the client where it can be reused without the additional request. So we use a state transfer service to do that. Um, 
It works by creating a state key, which you can use to set some data against the state, and then reuse it later if it's available. The way that that works is it just takes the blob of JSON um, and dumps it into your uh, HTML response. But that means a couple of things have to be careful. For one, we don't want to send too much data. If we just send thousands of kilobytes of JSON, everything gets way slower, and that's not good. And you also have to make sure that your whole state that you're sending over um, must be JSON serializable. So that means you can't send any date objects, any functions, any maps, nothing, nothing too fancy. The way that I like to do this, um, like I said before, our application is using NGRX. And what that means is that at the point when um, the render has happened on the server, the whole state of the application should be in the store at that point in time. We can add some code that just runs on the server and take the entire store and add it to the transfer state service with just one key, um, just by subscribing and pulling out everything out of our NGRX store. Then on the client, we just use that same key, check if we have it, and then just dispatch a new action to our store that contains the whole state. So now we've got all of our data shared between the client and the server. We just have a simple caching mechanism um, which lets us prevent the calls from happening again. We split our effect into two parts, um, one which gets the data and the other which does the API call. First time it happens, we mark the response with a cache key, and then every time after we look at that cache time and see if it's expired. So, last demo, let's hope it works. I can just run our server build, and if we come in here, let's do a new tab. So it'll be nice. nice and fast, nice and clean. We don't get any re-flickers for the data loading in, um, and you can kind of see the background animation pop in as the client rehydrates. That's pretty nice. It's a pretty cool universal render. So one more time over those patterns, just quickly. We can have one implementation for all the environments. That's like your components, things like that, many of your services. Implementations for specific environments, where we only want to run something on one platform, and we can just turn stuff off. Different implement implementations for each environment, how Universal works under the hood. And we want to have sometimes different functionality on each of those platforms. Cool. So. Hopefully that's all great, and you're wanting to run off and write a whole bunch of new applications using Universal. But let's think about some reasons why you might not want to use this before we wrap up. So there is a lot more complexity involved in this situation. You've now got a real server up and running, not just static files. Going to be lots more code, especially to get it ready for production. You're going to have logging, monitoring, error reporting, error handling. And like I said before, this has been one of the biggest challenges for us at TradeMe. And practically, that additional complexity basically means it's going to be sometimes harder for you to build stuff that you want to build, at least a little bit slower. Performance as well kind of gets touted as this great thing with Angular Universal, but it's certainly not a magical fix by any means. And you can actually make stuff worse if you're not careful. If performance is your only goal, as everyone says, just ship less JavaScript um, and always measure, measure, measure. So related to complexity, um, it's worth noting that the workflows around some of the stuff, they're pretty average. Build times are really slow. Even with this pretty small application, we have to build it once for the browser, once for the server, and then the whole server itself. And it can make dev cycles quite taxing. But apparently, Bazel will fix it. I've heard this a couple times now. And if that doesn't, then Matthias assures me that Ivy will. <laughs> Thankfully, we can introduce a whole bunch of tooling um, to make some of these downsides a bit better. We can use custom lint rules to check for APIs we don't want to use, or for the sweet is browser functions. We can add dev time meta reducers with NGRX to make sure that we're not making any data that is unserializable. We can write some tests, check that we're not shipping too much to the client and we can just write a whole bunch of universal-friendly tests. So if you want or need your Angular app to be crawled by search engines, if you want or need improved support for old browsers or for environments without JavaScript, 
If you want content previews for social media, and if you're willing to fight for some better perceived performance, is this going to work this time? Let's see. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, massive shout out to everyone who helped me get this talk ready, especially um, one and only Jeff Welpley. Hit me up with any questions on Twitter. Um, I'm sure there will be lots. I'll be around the next day and a half. Please come find me, and I'll post all this stuff online later. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, if you guys want to follow him, don't make the same mistake that I made because it's not phenomenal, it's phenomenal. Phenom nom. Phenom nominal. And he's super fun. You're super fun. That was fun. You want to dance? Yeah. Okay, so they asked me to do the MC, and I was like, of course I'll do the MC because I love it when you put a mic in my hand. I'm sorry for you guys. Uh, but I was concerned about one thing because I really didn't want to miss this talk. Uh, so I've been stalking, I actually just met Max, I think I'm, I met Maxim uh, once before at a conference, but the last couple months I've been stalking him online because he has really amazing blog posts about DOM manipulation. And I didn't really care about DOM manipulation, but once I started getting into it, I actually, you know, I learned some tricks that I find I use them every day. So uh, let's hear it for Max. Okay, how are you doing today? Ready for some really, really deep stuff? You know, I've been wanting to give this talk for almost a year now. I submitted uh, it to ng-conf, to Angular App, to other uh, conferences, along with other talks. And they always chose different talks, you know? Um, maybe they thought this one is very, very too deep dive. But uh, finally, I have a chance to deliver it here at Angular Connect. So I'm um, really happy about that. Um, now, my name's Max. I, most of you, some of you know me as ng Wizard. Uh, I've recently been upgraded to Wizard of the Web. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm known to reverse engineer frameworks. And as I do that, I try to give away the secrets uh, that are inside these frameworks. And I do that uh, to inspire you all to uh, become better developers. So I've spent a lot of time reverse engineering. I think I qualify as a um, reverse engineering addict, if, I don't know if there is such thing. Uh, and this one topic that fascinates me the most, which is change detection. All right, it's a very mysterious topic in Angular. There are a lot of things involved in that, and today we're going to look at the internals, and uh, you'll know how it works. And then you'll see a lot of people coming in, so that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm smiling. Um, okay, so what is change detection? Basically, change detection in general it's the mechanism designed to track changes in the application state and render the updated state on the screen, right? And modern web applications are interactive. Right, user can click on a button and the state changes. So we need to detect that and update the screen. Right? So that's the purpose of change detection in general. And um, it's the core of most frameworks, React, Angular. And uh, all frameworks implement it differently. So why do you need to know how exactly change detection works in Angular? Right? Because um, most of, the stuff, uh, most of the time, change detection just sits there quietly inside Angular and just works, right? We, we don't need to know how it works or what it does. But once in a while, things go awry and it causes errors, performance issues, and even confusions. So are you guys familiar with this error? <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. Um, this one... I think tops the list of the most confusing errors in Angular. Some developers even think that it's a bug. I, I've seen a few GitHub issues that <laughs> request the fix. Well, it's not a bug. Uh, there's a purpose for this error. And today we'll learn why we sometimes get it. 
Also, as you know, uh, change detection in Angular runs over the entire tree of components. Right? We take some time, and it runs synchronously. And if it runs too often, it, is, uh, it may cause delays or even unresponsive applications. Right? So performance, again, is the area where the knowledge of change detection internals can help you. Right? Because you'll be able to pinpoint the areas of your application that cause excessive change detection runs and optimize them. OK, now before we dive in, just a few words about myself. I already told you about my addiction. I, I really like to live on the edge. Um, uh, do we have risk takers in the audience today? Just raise your hand. OK. <laughs> All right. Well, I think not many people raise their hands, but I think <laughs> We are all risk takers because we take our chances every day with JavaScript, right, during our work. <laughs> so I also uh, like to walk on railroad tracks, and somewhere in the middle of my traveling, I managed to become a Google Dev Expert and receive the MVP award. And I was so blown away by how good Asia Grid was here and the team behind it that I decided, decided to join them as a developer advocate. So that's where I work. Okay, also most of my free time goes to Angular in-depth. How many of you know about Angular in-depth? Oh, a lot more hands. Yeah, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, this is the place where I write about Angular internals and the architecture of Angular applications. And I also inspired the awesome community of writers who helped me uh, propel this uh, resource. Okay, so finally we're ready to dive in. And we're going to start with a simple widget. So the idea here, this component, when we click on the button, will show you the time when change detection happens in Angular, right? Because when you click on the button, it triggers change detection. So we're going to see a screen updated. And here's what the implementation looks like for this component, right? Just notice how simple it is. We only have one uh, setter, oh, sorry, getter named time. And we bind it to the spawn element through the text content binding. Right, so we want to display that text in the spawn. And um, now, if I run this, just you can see that the screen being updated. I'm going to click on the button. Okay, you see, screen's being updated. But then I open a console, and um, I will see this now. <laughs> okay, an error, right? The error expression changed after it was checked. Well. Uh, we certainly didn't expect it there because we have such a simple functionality, right? Just one getter and one binding, right? We usually get this error when we have complex hierarchies, a lot of updates, but it's just one getter, okay? So how is it possible that we received it? Well, no worries. This is, about, this is what we're about to investigate, and we'll start with the error message. So this is the binding related to the error. And what the error tells us is that uh, basically it evaluated the expression that we provided for the text content, and it detected the difference, right? Indeed, there is a difference one millisecond between the values. OK. Now, why did Angular do that? Why did it evaluate it twice instead of just once, right? Um, and when exactly during change detection did it happen? So um, these are the questions that sparked my interest originally and eventually led me down to the internals of change detection, right? Because to find answers to these questions, I had to read the sources and debug. And debug, and I can say that I debugged for a few months, really, because you, you won't find this explanation on the web, so I had to do that on my own. And I've discovered a lot of a lot of interest and things inside Angular. So today I want to share some of them with you. And let's start with this. Um, it's a template, right? Every component in Angular has a template with HTML, okay, <laughs> uh, with uh, HTML elements. So when Angular uh, creates an instance of a component, it needs to create DOM nodes for these HTML elements, right? And uh, there's got to be a place for Angular to put this reference into. Because when a component is destroyed, what we want to do, we want to remove these DOM nodes from the document, right? So there's got to be a place. Also, Angular creates uh, an instance of a component class, right? 
Also, there's a reference to it, so it needs to be stored somewhere. And in fact, in Angular, there is a data structure internally specifically for that purpose. It's called a view. So one thing to remember from this talk is that every component in Angular under the hood is represented as a view. There is one-to-one -one relationship. OK? Then, as a compiler goes through the template, it tries to identify uh, properties of DOM elements uh, that needs to be updated during change detection. Right? And in our case, this is text content property. For each such property, Angular creates something called binding. Okay? And the binding is a data structure that uh, defines two things what we need to update during change detection, and where to get value from, right? And it's an expression that you specify in the template. And if you have many bindings, usually you have a lot of bindings in a template, you will have each binding created for each um, such association. So a view created for a component and a set of bindings created for that component's template are the main building blocks of change detection in Angular, OK? Now, here's how they are used. So when Angular runs a change detection for a view, so I'm saying for a view, but you can hear for a component, right? Because <laughs> I just told you that there's one-to-one -one relationship. But internally, Angular works with views, OK? So when Angular runs change detection for a view, or we can say checks the view, it runs over all bindings created for that component and evaluates expressions, compares the result of the expressions to the previous values okay, of that expressions. Again, there is the property called old values on the view where Angular puts these old uh, results so it can compare them. And this is what is known as dirty checking. Okay, so it runs over bindings compares the results, and if it detects the difference, it updates the DOM. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism of change detection. And we'll see later, I'll show you this view and these bindings, you will, um, and the old values, you'll be able to see it in runtime. So, let's get back to our uh, error that we started with. We only have one binding to text content property, right? So, suppose Angular runs change detection for this component, uh, evaluates the expression, basically just reads the time from the component. Okay, so it compares it to the previous value. Suppose it detects the difference and it updates the DOM, right? And also puts the current value to the old values array. Now, what's interesting is that right after that, synchronously, Angular runs an extra check to ensure that the expressions that it evaluated during change detection return the same result. Okay, this, is, this happens only in the development mode, and we'll learn a bit later why Angular does it. But right now, I'm trying to explain you the mechanism. Okay, so, um, and if the expressions produce different results, then it basically, this check performs exactly the same steps as change detection. Uh, runs over bindings, evaluates, compares, but if it detects the difference, it throws the error. Okay? So, what happened in our case is that uh, basically we have date now here, right? That returns the current time step with millisecond precision. So, when Angular evaluated this time, it produced one result then probably change detection took a, a more than one millisecond to run across all the tree of components, or in our case, just one component. And then it evaluated again this time, which date now produced different result, right? We, we saw this one millisecond difference. And it throw the error. How do we fix it, right? Notice that uh, I told you that Angular runs this check synchronously. Okay, right after change detection. So if we update this value asynchronously, we will avoid the error. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna 
move the update logic, the evaluation logic, out of the time property, right? Just stored as a private uh, variable on the component. And now I need to update it, uh, this property asynchronously. So I will use an async function that we have in JavaScript, which is set interval. Okay, and since uh, we always want to have the current time with one millisecond precision, I'm um, using here one millisecond delay for the set interval. Okay, so we'll run every one millisecond, we'll execute the callback that will update private property uh, time, right? And when Angular runs change detection, it will just read the latest update. Okay, that's the main idea. And this is a good solution, and it would work if not for one thing. Who knows what is the reason? It won't work. Uh, okay, well, set interval in Angular triggers change detection. So if it runs continuously every one millisecond, we're going to end up with an infinite loop of change detection runs. Okay? So we need to run this set interval but not trigger change detection, right? In that case, it would work. So how can we do that, and why the set interval triggers change detection in Angular? Well, it's because of the thing called the library called zone.js, and I guess you're all familiar with that, right? So just a few words about zone.js. Um, I want you to know that, or maybe you, are know, you know that, but uh, contrary to popular belief, zone.js is not part of change detection mechanism in Angular. It's a standalone third-party library. Angular uses it to get notifications about asynchronous events, right? Like in our case, it's a set interval that notifies Angular. Yet the framework, the Angular, can work without zone GS, right? It's just in that case, it won't get notifications about set interval and other asynchronous events. But um, it can really well work without it. Now, um, regarding zone.js, we can have multiple zones on a web page, right? The zone provides an API to create different zones. And Angular only gets notifications about uh, asynchronous events that are triggered within ng zone. This is the zone that Angular itself creates when it bootstraps. So, and all your application code usually runs within that in zone. But you can run code outside of Angular Zone, for example, in Zone A. And Zone.js provides API to do that. So, and this is exactly what we need, right? We need to run set interval, update private property, but not notify Angular, right? And no notification means uh, no change detection. So that is the solution that we need. Okay, so getting back to this code where we update the value asynchronously. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna inject ng-zone now and just wrap it in the run outside Angular method. Okay, that's a simple fix. So in this case, what we're doing is we are updating uh, private property time asynchronously, okay? which means that uh, the synchronous check that follows change detection won't detect the difference, right? We update value asynchronously. And to avoid change detection, we run this code outside of Angular zone. Okay? Now, uh, this is a very common optimization technique. If you wanna run some heavy computational code and want to avoid uh, change detection runs, just uh, execute your code outside of Angular Zone. Okay, now uh, let's summarize what we've learned. And we've learned already quite a lot. So um, every component in Angular is represented as a view under the hood. We have a bunch of bindings created by the compiler during change detection. Angular runs over these bindings, evaluates expressions, compares them, and updates the DOM if necessary. And right after that, <coughs> in the development mode, Angular runs a synchronous check and compares the results and uh, if it detects the difference, 
it updates the DOM. Okay, now you might be wondering, okay, Max, this view, these bindings, these DOM nodes, references, all pretty abstract. Is there any way we can see them, right? And I told you that I would show you. So um, I spent a lot of time debugging applications, you know? So I know where I need to put debugger in the sources to figure out what's going on. And this function, check and update view, is the one function you need to know uh, and this is where you need to put debugger, where I put debugger often when I debug change detection. So let me show it to you. So this is our code, right, our application. I'm going to open a console now, and uh, this function is in the core module. So I will find it now in the core module, okay? We're going to wait <laughs> till I do that. So once I find it, I'll put a breakpoint here, okay, and trigger change detection. So I'll click on the button to trigger change detection. And here's the view, you see, created for our component. This is the instance of the component, you see? Then, these are the nodes, the references to DOM nodes, created for the template. Here's, for example, span element node. And also old values, right, where Angular keeps the results of the expressions from previous evaluations. This is the result of the last evaluated expression for the binding. Okay, so I encourage you to put a breakpoint, to find that function, put a breakpoint there, and just play with it a little bit. You will we'll see how many, uh, what operations Angular performs for a view, or explore these data structures. It's actually very, very interesting. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about this error in the context of uh, something called unidirectional data flow. I also assume that most of you have read articles about unidirectional data flow, why it's important, how it's different to AngularJS. I want to talk again about it now. So what is it exactly? Every application, uh, every Angular application has two phases. The first phase is updating the application state or component state, right? And it happens as a result of some callback invocation. For example, user click on the button, your callback is executed, you updated one component, and then maybe through a shared service, you've updated other components as well. So the second phase is rendering. Basically taking that state and projecting it into something we can see on the screen. And you as a user is responsible, or as a developer is responsible for updating the state, registering callbacks, performing business logic. But Angular as a framework, is responsible for rendering that state, okay? And it does, does it uh, through the mechanism of change detection. But there is one important limitation of change detection. As soon as Angular checked one view or one component and moved to the shared components, you can no longer update the properties of the component that are used in the bindings, right? Because during the synchronous check, Angular will reevaluate the expression and will detect the difference, okay? You can still, however, update other properties on a component that are not used in bindings. So <clears throat> this is the restriction imposed by the unidirectional data flow. And this is why Angular has this check, right? To ensure that state hasn't changed. Now, um, What's also important is that uh, unidirectional data flow I'm talking about in terms of change detection is related to this uh, presentation layer. Because you also may have heard about unidirectional data flow imposed by uh, state management libraries like NGRX, right? We go through one flow. So these are two different unidirectional data flows, okay? I'm talking about now, and the error produced by the check is related to the presentation layer. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just want to show you something. Here's a simple hierarchy of two components. And um, so here I'm going to um, <clears throat> update uh, the property text of the parent component after Angular checked uh, the parent component. So I'm using after view checked hook here I'm injecting a parent component, I'm updating its property. Okay, so if I run this code and open the console, what I'm gonna see? 
the error, right? So we're just uh, doing what we aren't supposed to do. But what's interesting is that what if I now move that code outside of after view checked and put it in different hook on init? Am I going to see the error on the console now? And it's weird, but there won't be error there. <laughs> and it was very surprising to me. And I saw a thread on GitHub, people wondering how is after view checked hook so special? Why we cannot put, put our update code into this hook, but can't put it into other hooks? And uh, to understand this, you need to know what exactly Angular does during change detection and the order. What is important is the order of operations. <clears throat> and we already know where we can find them. The function check and update view, the one I showed you earlier, right? This is the function that runs all operations for a view. Here's part of the code from that function. And this is the uh, line where Angular process bindings, runs over bindings, and performs rendering. But you can see here also other operations, like calling uh, lifecycle hooks. And you can see that some of the hooks are called before the rendering part, and some hooks are called after the rendering part. OK, here's the other diagram. So this is very important. Pay attention. If you haven't paid attention <laughs> before, look at it now. So I'm, I'm going to show you what Angular exactly does when it checks parent component. So first, it updates input bindings for the child component. OK? This is something that you use input decorator, right? on the child component. This is updated during checking a parent component. Then it calls on init to check and on changes hooks on the child component. Keep in mind that we're checking now parent component, but calling hooks on the child component. And it makes sense, right? Because we just updated all input bindings on the, parent, on the child component, so we want to notify the component that all bindings have been initialized. OK, makes sense. Now, Angular runs over bindings, basically performs rendering for the current parent component. And uh, then it runs change detection for the child component. And it calls the after view checked and view init hooks for the child component. Again, makes sense because it just checked the child component, previous operation, right? So it just wants to let the component know that um, it's been checked, so you can do whatever you need. And as you can see, the hooks only need on changes and do check are executed before Angular process bindings and evaluated expressions for the, for the current uh, parent component. And after view check is called after that. That's why if we put the code in different hooks, we get different results. OK, um, we've learned, I think you've learned quite a lot, I hope. <laughs> um, so where do you go from here? I've written a lot of articles, like 60 on Angular internals. So you don't need to read all of them, but I recommend you read the following article. So this one is about expression changed error. So it provides an elaborate explanation of the, error, uh, of the error, basically what I just told you, but in a more uh, elaborate way. And um, also outlines common use cases when this error occurs and possible fixes. OK? Then change detection. This article um, outlines a list of five articles <laughs> that you need to read to become an expert in change detection in Angular. And the last one on reverse engineering. Uh, what I've told you today, basically what I've been writing about and speaking at other conferences, I've learned by reading sources and debugging, which is reverse engineering, sort of reverse engineering, right? And to me, this is the most rewarding way to learn. Yet I admit it's very, very challenging. So this article uh, summarizes my experience doing that over the period of one year, and uh, <clears throat> provide some guidelines how you can, can start doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, so also outline some uh, interesting debugging techniques, so please check it. 
Now, if you have any questions, this is the t-shirt I'll be wearing, walking on the hallway, so stop by, say hi, ask questions. Follow me on Twitter for more insights, because I regularly tweet about the stuff I find inside the framework, interesting use cases. I promise I won't waste your time. <laughs> it's very, very important. I have plans to write a follow-up article on, on this talk, so expect some tweets quite soon. And a mountain. <laughs> so my talk has come to an end. I hope that uh, the knowledge that you've learned today, that we've covered today, has awakened your uh, curiosity and the thirst to know more. So I encourage you to never stop learning. You'll be able to reach new heights every day uh, because I want you all guys to be extraordinary engineers. Thank you for your attention and good luck. Now you know why they call him wizard. Okay, so we have a five minute break and uh, we have slides up here in track one. We've got Martin Probes talking about why you need a build system and why it should be Bazel. Here in this room in five minutes, we've got Bo Vandersteen, who is awesome. She's talking about Nest, uh, Nest the backend for your Angular uh, application. And also office hours, that guy that just walked off the stage and the one that was on before him are gonna be in office hours. So if you guys wanna ask questions, go check it out. And uh, we'll see you all back in about five minutes.
Thank you. Oh, because the music was on. I got it. You guys are good. Okay, I want to know, show of hands, who's got a Twitter account? Or actually, better yet, who doesn't have a Twitter account? <laughs> Okay, so I really, um, I'm not a big fan of social media because I really don't want to know what all my friends had for breakfast or, you know, 50 pictures of their dogs and kids and stuff like that. But just a shout out to those of you who have not jumped on Twitter. Twitter is an amazing wealth of uh, tech knowledge, especially in the Angular community. Uh, pretty much all of the speakers and uh, and a lot of the, the people who are, who are writing awesome blog posts, they'll tweet them. Uh, just be careful who you follow and try to avoid American politics because... It's not good. Uh, anyway, so, so I just wanted to say that if you guys don't have a Twitter account, make one. And if you follow the right people, you can actually have a really amazing Twitter feed like mine. Uh, OK, and <laughs> really, most importantly, I have to say, so I just met Bo uh, last night. And she's kind of amazing. Um, is this your first? This is your first talk on stage? This is her first conference talk, you guys. You guys have to give her like a big, huge, hold on. If you're out in the hall, we're getting started. Come on in. No, they've closed the doors. It's too late. Okay, so you guys, I want y'all to give her like a big, huge, warm, warm welcome. This is Bo. Hello, everyone. So I'm Bo, my first talk here on Angular Connect. In fact, it was my goal last year when I was here. It was like, okay, I want to be on stage next year, and I'm glad I made it. So. I'm pretty proud of it. So today I will talk about Nest, the backend for your Angular application. I will start my code with a talk. With the, we built our computer systems the way we built our cities over time without a plan on top of reuns. If we start thinking about this code, we have built an application. But before it was like built on C++ with a layer with PLSQL between it, maybe some Java or .NET, I don't know. You make a mess out of it, and at the end, you are afraid to change something at the bottom. There's no structure in it to it. And then you keep building further on this, with new te technologies mixed with old ones. And yeah, at the end, we maybe need to rebuild our whole application. So after this code, I will first introduce myself. So I'm Bo van der Steenen. I live in Belgium in a town with two great beers, world beers. If you are there, you need to taste them. I work as an Angular coach for now for Colroyd. Colroyd is the biggest retail company in Belgium, for people who don't know it. My goal as an Angular coach and a software engineer is to provide maintainable applications that are performant. And also, afterwards, you can work with it and teach people new things. I have also two beautiful cats on the left side of my, on the right side of my slides, and next to it, I'm also a volunteer firefighter and paramedic in my hometown. Sometimes I write a blog or I tweet something. You can also contact me afterwards on Twitter. But now I will start with some front-end history. Maybe for some people it will be similar. My first steps into programming were like JavaScript and Ajax. Ajax, 15 years ago, great because from the first time I made a web application, I didn't like the fact that you have server-side rendered page. You click on something, it's like the page is refreshed, you need to wait. No, I want to data and I want to have a fluent application. So at the moment, jQuery was there. Yeah, 12 years ago it was maybe great, but nowadays I don't like it anymore. So then, in think somewhere around 2010, I discovered Angular GS, first version of Angular, add some nice architecture to our front-end application. Maybe not 100% what we want, but it's nice. And also the fact that you can couple it with TypeScript. It's also nice, and at the end, Angular 2 was there. So we have something really nice in the front-end world. But then we take a challenge. We want to create a backend in JavaScript. Why? We love JavaScript. We can start reuse our front-end users for backend. We can want to try something new, maybe. 
And then if you take a look what was existing, it was like Node.js, Express, Lightweight, Webpack, TypeScript. We start building our application. I have a background as a Java, Java developer, so I know Spring. But is this what we really want? We don't have any structure in our application. And if you start ser searching on the internet, you will maybe affect Nest. Nest, it puts some architecture in your application. If we compare it to Angular, yeah, I love XGS, reactive programming. I hope some others also. It's also available in Nest. Next to it, I love also TypeScript. It adds some type safety to your application. It adds basic concepts of object-oriented programming to your front-end application. Maintainability in a team is great. Also, dependency injection is something I love in Angular. It's also possible in Nest, also working in feature modules, both possible. If you start looking at an application, I made an example application. This is an example application will be a comic collection. So first of all, for every application, we start with a design, with a model or design, for example. And we have our application. Application is the upper level of our application, of course. Then we have a part for user management. Maybe we want to have multiple users, authentication, and so on. So this part is a future user. Then we have our comic, of course, somewhere we need to define our comics. And on the other hand, we have, of course, our own collection. Our own collection, which will consist of all the comics we want to have. So we want to extend this one. And in Angular, also, we can easily add a new feature module. With a minimal effort, we can add this module. And if we start looking at the structure, I've put Nest and Angular next to each other. On the right side, you see Nest. On the left side, you see Angular. And if you take a quick look at it, it's almost the same structure. You have three feature modules, Comic, My Collection, and User. You have something to do with apps, and then you have some initialized files. So for an Angular user, it's well, like, wow, if I didn't know that you put it, the Nest logo on top of it, it's almost the same. We have both modules. And then we will take a deeper look into our app module file. Our app module file. It's a Nest file. Again, if you take a quicker look at it, it's almost the same as an Angular file. The only difference that you see, of course, the end port, but on the other hand, also, we have controllers instead of components. So to explain this to someone that doesn't know about Nest, and ports, OK, these are other modules that we have required for this feature. Providers, yeah, providers are most of the time services, like in Angular. Exports, OK, everything that we want to export that needs to be reused in another app, other module. And then on the other hand, we have controllers. In Angular, we have components. Components to represent our data in a nice way on the screen. Here, you have controllers to represent your data as a JSON. And if we look at our layer architecture and the backend, we have our HTTP request that comes, of course, from the browser. It enters a controller. A controller in the backend is responsible to have the routing, like you have the component, and it will represent it as a JSON object. Then a controller always calls a service. A service will have the backend logic or the business logic. It doesn't care where data comes from, but it wants to do something with this data. For example, a calculation. It returns the result to the controller. On the other hand, you have also the data access layer. Data access layer for connecting to a database. It can be a MongoDB, a relational database, a file system. It doesn't depend. So you see, if you want to switch from tomorrow to today to another system to have your data, for example, from MongoDB to a relational database, you can do it with only affecting one layer, the data access layer. Now, again, if we compare it to Angular, our controller are similar to components. Components will also be represented after a route. Services, yeah, same thing. We'd be, we put business logic into our services. And on the other hand, you have the data access. And if we compare it, 
the HTTP client to receive backend calls or the store. If you use Redix, you can, for example, have an NGRX store. That's similar. You have your data stored somewhere. And I've made also some code examples. In this case, I hope everyone will recognize this. It's just a getter to the HTTP client that calls a certain route. Now we have, next to it, the controller. And if we start looking at it, we see some similar things. For example, the route. Of course, the route on the back end is the same route as on the front end code, because we want to call our own back end. On the other hand, we can see also something similar. The, re the result of our getter is the same array as the result that our controller will produce. And also the parameters passed are the same. We have a search term, we have a page, we have a limit, also our controller. So this is like hard coupled. It's the only thing that's like hard coupled in a front end back end relationship. And this, the, the API, if you don't have that contract respected, then you have a problem. If you change something in your back end and you don't change it in the front end, yeah, it will be broken. Vice versa also, if you change something in your front end and you don't change it in your back end, then you have again a problem. It will be broken. So why we should not share this code? And if you work on both sides in the same language, it's, the, it's easy. So somewhere we create a common library. And this common library has, for example, an interface Siri, the same interface as before. And we declare some fields, so ID, name, sort name, country ID. If we want to add some someone, some field, or remove a field, we can do it on an easy way. And we will start using everywhere the Siri. For example, if we declare an entity, we will implement the Siri, and there we will put some relations. We need to be careful that we don't put in our contract too many dependencies to the backend library. For example, if we put dependencies to NestJS to access a file system, yeah, on the front end side, we don't have it. So our application will not run there. And maybe we can also share something else, not only contracts. contracts. For example, we have a calculation. We do the calculation on the front end because it needs to be fast. And we can send the result to the back end, but as you all know, if you know how to make an API call, you can post it, for example, via Postman with a result. So you can manipulate this result. So if you want to be secure, you need to redo this calculation in the back end. And if you use the same language, you can share it again. For example, I have some really weird calculation I have put some numbers, I do something with it, as you see here, and it gives a result with a fixed number with three decimals. So, and I put it in my common folder. So here you see already, I have an entity folder, a security folder, for example, my complex calculation, and also a public API TS file. This file we can link in our TS config file, and say, OK, this is the single place of truth for this at common library. And then we start choosing it. Our calculate component will retrieve three, val three values and make the complex calculation. Also, our backend service will do it on the same way. It will use these three values to do the complex calculation. But yeah, we have like controllers, services, and a data access layer. But in Angular, we know also something like a HTTP interceptor or guards for security. So you can put some logic on a global basis. Yeah. And Nest, it's also like this. You have, in fact, five building blocks. It's like you have an interceptor similar to the HTTP interceptor. You have a guard, yeah, similar to the guard. You have pipes. Pipes are for validation of your input. Uh, you have an exception filter, so you can write always your exceptions in the same way. So it's also easy to capture them in the front end then. And at the end, you have also middleware. And that's like the trash. Everything that doesn't fit in one of the building blocks will be there. 
And if we now start looking, for example, at the guard. So we have our route from Angular. It goes to the guard. The guard goes to the component. The component calls, of course, one or another service. This does a HTTP request. Again, it enters by guard a nest, and it's well handled by a route. OK, but the guard on the front end and the back end needs to have the same access rights. Because on a certain route, we can, like having a super user, and if we don't, don't add the same security on the back end, then we have a problem. Because I can still access it with my postman again. On the other hand, if you say, for example, OK, every user can access this component in the front end, but in the back end, we make our security too hard, yeah, then again, we have a problem because you will always get an unauthorized error. So again, we can share something. I've made my app routing module. Most of the people will recognize this. I have a super user guard. And on my user controller, this Nest, I have the same super user guard, I think. So both places, super user. So it's quite good because on both places, I have the same access rights. But now I need to do something different. I create, again, a shared file that contains consist of some roles, for example, admin and super user. This one are quite simple, but can you imagine? I've made once a planning tool that have different groups, and every group has, has its own admin. Then you can make a more complex um, comparison for this. So we can start using it. And our super user guard, of course, everyone know it, knows this. We have the can activate. We have the next and the state um, parameters passed, and we get our user, in this case, out of the local, sto local storage. And we test if it's a super user. So next step is to see how it works in Nest. Again, first look on this class. It's like, oh, it's like Angular, you would say, but a bit different. You have the can activate, and here you have a context. And this context, you can get out to user. For example, you can also say, OK, I want first to check this user in my database. And then I will send if it has this rights. So for getting these principles, it's like almost the same. Also for an interceptor. In Angular, we know, OK, we have a request. We can pass it through an interceptor. Then we go to our backend. Our backend go back with the response to our interceptor through Angular. So if we have, for example, a log interceptor to check how long our call is taken, we can have, for example, a date. And then at the end, we make the difference between the date and we have our time in milliseconds. And on Nest, we have similar. We come from our, back, from our HTTP call. We have a request. It goes to the controller. And it's give some response back through the interceptor. Again, we have our time that, we can, we, that our call takes. Again, it's, it's something similar. That's like the nice thing to Nest and Angular. And you have also some other options. I think a lot of people have already heard about microservices. Angular is easy scalable. It offers support for for example, API calls between different microservices, TCP, RCP, everything you can think about in microservices, it offers out of the box. Also, PapSockets offers out of, the, out, the, out, of, out of the box by Nest. Also, GraphQL is offered out of the box by Nest. So you can start doing already some magic things with Nest. But it's also heavily extensible. Some of you maybe do some backend Java de development already, use some node packages. Yeah. If you look at Nest, it's only an architecture around your backend application. So it connects different packages together to have, at, at the end, the result. So out of the box, again, it offers you some of these connections. For, for example, Passport, that's well known in the express world for doing authentication together with JOT tokens. Also, Swagger is out of the box 
and out of the box supported, and also just testing. Maybe some of you do already some just testing. I like it. Also out of the box support for Mongoose for database connections. Also out of the box support for Typo M. Also it offers support for relational databases and uh, Mongo databases. So you see you can already start doing something out of the box. And now we come to the fact we want to deploy our Angular and Nest application. Would it not be good if we have like, first if we, we want to optimize our application for a search engine that for or some pages are rendered out of the box. Um, also we want to have an easy deploy, everything on one side, we want to put it on our, on our server, yeah. Maybe we have already something Angular Universal to do server side rendering and go afterwards to single page apps, but we can also use it together. It's a package offered, NestJS and NG Universal, that works together, that offers you all the benefits of Universal. It's just a layer between, uh, it's not a new package. So, how can we add it to our application? Just install it from NPM, of course, and then we can add it to our app module from our backend application from our Nest application and just Angular, Angular Universal module for root. We, our view paths are the directory where our Angular application is compiled in and then we have also some server main file. Some server main file, we have this also for a normal universal application so it's not completely for Nest. And then we have, of course, a Webpack configuration. Normally, a Webpack configuration is like very big. In this case, it's smaller because, again, Nest has already done some boilerplate code for it. It has like minimalized and some things you can parameterize still yourself because most of the time, Webpack, if I do it, it's copy-paste from another project. And adjust the settings where it's needed. So here again, it's the same. And then we have our pre-render file. Again, for Angular, Angular Universal, for the people who have already done this, you need also a pre-render file. You define some routes, and these routes are like, okay, these routes need to be pre-rendered, um, and you define them here. And you have, of course, a main server file that only expose like your app server module, Again, this is basic universal. It has nothing to do with Nest, but you can combine these. And at the end, you have also your Angular JSON file that you have to adjust, so you can run your Angular CLI commands through for start up your server, and of course the tsconfig file for the server. And at the end, you have a project that looks like this. You have the common. You have also my collection. You see the end-to-end, -end, so it's an Angular application. You have the ser server, and you have the utils. So in fact, in your one uh, project, you can have your Angular JSON. You see here also a Nest CLI JSON file. You can combine them in the same place on the same project. And of course, your Webpack config files and so on are there also. So everything will be bundled on one place. But yeah, I think I have still five minutes or something. I can tell a lot more about Nest, but if you want to know more about it, definitely check out the site and start playing with it. You see, as an Angular developer, it's easy to adapt Nest because it's all, all the same concepts. And now, why should we use Nest? Because we want to have everywhere JavaScript. Yeah, why? Because we like JavaScript. But also, we can improve our productivity. We can reuse our front-end users, uh, front-end developers to do some back-end work. Also, if we discuss something between back-end and front-end, we can like, okay, we have the same problem because we are in the same language. If we have problems with asynchronity, yeah, it's easy to discuss. 
Also reusability of code, like I've shown, if you have a complex calculation, you can start to use the code. Also, for example, to have some security reasons or sharing routes and so on and contracts, you can reuse it. And also, the community behind JavaScript is really huge. You have like the node system, the NPM system, where every package is on. You have a large contribution from around the world. And you have also, if you check Stack Overflow, it's one, it's one of the highest um, languages that has support on Stack Overflow, so community is huge. Now, where we should add Nest, because it adds some architecture to uh, your application. That's nice, some architecture to have maintain maintainability. And also performance will be improved. If you have a maintainable application, if tomorrow a new developer join the team and there is architecture, the architecture in your application is good, then you can introduce him fast and he is not afraid to change something. And also it's fast and scalability with the default offer of microservices and GraphQL and WebSockets. You can really build your application on a fast way, add new modules on an easy way. So thank you for your attention and I hope I have made you warm for to start using Nest. Um, so that was it for me today.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a lovely little break. Um, our next speaker, Stefan, leads the design team at Infragistics, who are one of our sponsors. Originally a software engineer, Stefan actually made the switch into design, so he's very well positioned to talk to us today about Angular and Sketch. So please put your hands together and welcome Stefan. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here on this stage. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting us and letting us be part of this amazing event. So today, I actually want to show you, within the five minutes we have, a real quick demo of what we've been putting together throughout the past one year. And it's, it's a design system which actually kind of um, takes one step further our Ignite UI for Angular product, which is a whole set of 30 plus Angular native components. So what you see now is actually a project I have in Sketch with some screens. And what, uh, what Indigo.design does is that it, it is a set of a few libraries and more stuff. Uh, but the libraries are built for Sketch. And they map exactly to our Ignite UI for Angular components, providing things like avatars, badges, charts, grids, and whatnot. Uh, this list is even longer in the version we're pushing out this week. So you're actually able to build such interfaces, such simple uh, login forms, or even more complex interfaces like the one here um, within Sketch, which lets your team actually iterate the design. And of course, when it comes to design, very often people ask about styling. So we try to mimic the way our powerful Theming engine works in Ignite UI for Angular, both regarding colors and typography in Sketch, allowing us to do certain things like, for example, changing the nuances for primary and secondary colors, um, taking that also, let's say, within the typography, and having those changes apply real time to all our designs so that we're able to recreate the brand real quick and he have the same consistent style across all the applications. So what I did here, I'm just going to quickly save it and show how throughout Sketch, through the usage of libraries and shared styles and colors, it's propagating little by little to the components. These are actually the file with the components that I showed before, which you're able to insert uh, and create your, your own interfaces. And I'm going to open up the app I had before. And once I push those updates here, we're going to see something that looks a lot more like we would like it to look. Um, however, we were able to improve this workflow of designer to developer handoff by building a set of additional tools. So one thing, for example, is our very own Indigo Sync plugin, which lets you actually publish this design. To, to the Indigo Cloud and use that as a way to, for example, run some usability studies, do some uh, customer tests. So uh, uh -huh. just give me a second until it loads. But I'm going to show it what eventually or where it eventually ends up. And it's this kind of a workspace where you have all your design documents. Uh, prob probably there's some trouble with the connection. So you have all, all your designs here for different apps, different scenarios. And I have like pre-built one just because I wanted to show you what the next step is. So once you publish it through the plugin or through the cloud directly, you're able to open a Visual Studio code. I have uh, scaffolded here through the uh, Angular CLI, an empty project. and. I will run a plugin that we've built for Visual Studio Code, which lets you paste the link and see what you have on that link here. Because all the components, as I already mentioned, map one to one with Ignite UI for Angular components. So once I generate those assets, it's going to spit out native Angular code from me, which is actually built from Sketch. Uh, and that's, of course, the Ignite UI for Angular components in there. So while it's kind of updating all the dependencies here, 
Um, <laughs> I'm gonna wait a couple of more seconds. So this is the app I started with. Actually, we're able to push those changes to all the projects we have. This is the plugin interface, letting you browse your workspaces, replace prototypes, and do whatever you need. And I guess this, yeah, it's ready now. So this login screen that I took from Sketch, uh, I'm just going to take this selector and replace this with it. Whoops. It's going to be stuck for a while at 92%, but I think that's something all of us are used to now, so it shouldn't be a surprise. And we have our interface generated with super clean code, behaving responsively the way we have set it up in Sketch. So that's actually uh, something that I believe saves a lot of time to designers and developers both. And it's a huge productivity booth, so if you want to learn more, feel free to stop by our table we set up just outside of the room as you have your next break. And with that, I would like to thank for the opportunity to share this with you and enjoy you, uh, and wish you uh, uh, to enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. So we mentioned at the start of the day that we had a bit of a scheduling change. Rob Wormald unfortunately wasn't able to come. Um, so actually before we start and before I invite our next speakers onto stage, um, I'd like you to ask to give you, for you to all give them a, a very large round of, round of applause for stepping in at last minute and putting together a 30 minute talk. So thank you very much. So our next speakers, Ashnita and Marcin. Ashnita is a front-end web developer, organizes study groups, and helps to help people sharpen their web development skills. And Marcin is a lead front-end developer um, working at Black Swan, a big data company. So please give them a very lovely Angular Connect welcome. Hello everyone, I'm Ashni Savali. And I'm Marcin Rzecki. And we are going to talk to you about the differences between element ref, Te template ref, and view Contain container ref. ref. Actually, we forgot to put view ref from our, in our title. Oh yeah, and the title should be then the difference between view ref, element ref, container ref, and something else, right? <laughs> <laughs> the title is more a, an innuendo to talk about views, view containers, host views, embedded views, templates, and how they work together. Actually, we could have shortened our title to say Dom, Angular's DOM abstraction. Or us like, us like to think about it, it's like more like UI abstraction, yeah? because Dom, uh, Angular application don't work just on the 
browser platform, but they also work on uh, another platforms. And that's why the certain abstraction layer is being required to, to cater for all the UI needs, right? So why did we want to talk about this anyway, Ashinta? Okay, when I started learning about dynamic components, I came across uh, creating embedded views, or what was referred to as uh, custom templates. I saw that when you use a view child query uh, to query an element, sometimes you get an element ref, sometimes you get a template ref, sometimes you get a view container ref. And I thought to myself, how am I going to remember all that? Also, when you create a dynamic component, you get the type component ref. When you add that to a view container, it is of type view ref. When a dynamic component is added to a view container, both when the dynamic component or um, the embedded views are added to a view container, they're of type view ref, and they get added to the same array called the embedded the em uh, called embedded embedded views. That's right. <laughs> Um, but the dynamically created uh, component is, called, is referred to as the host view, and the view created with the ng template is referred to as the embedded view. So I thought to myself, how am I going to go remember all of that as well? So I oh, thought so Angular is so hard. <laughs> so I spent more time learning about components and directives, and then thought, actually, the names are quite intuitive and make sense once you understand the concepts around um, DOM abstraction. That's right, yeah. Uh, for me, confusing, for example, was that I'm seeing in the code view ref, and the documentation says about view. Is it the same? I'm seeing view container ref everywhere, and, but nobody really talks about view container ref. Everybody says view container. Is it the same? So once once you put things in order and know that uh, there are concepts and then there are code representation of it and all these refs are really the representation of the concepts that help me to kind of systematize the terminology about that and there's no confusion. I, I see the code, if you continue ref, I know we're talking about view container. We'll cover all this in a second, yeah? And by the way, there's more confusion here. Sometimes you see, when you debug that stuff, you will see that it's actually not view container ref, it's a view container ref underscore. Why is that? Because view container ref is just an interface on abstract class in Angular code, and it's actually implemented by this view container ref underscore class, and that's what is being actually instantiated. But that's a minor detail, so let's not talk about this. Okay, let's talk about the first piece of the abstraction layer, element, and represented by element ref. Looking at the element ref class, we can see that it is simply a wrapper around the native element, which on the browser platform is a DOM element, and in native platform, it will be something else. In our code, we work with element ref, which is us working in the abstraction layer. We try not to touch the native elements directly. By the way, later on, uh, Stanimia has a lightning talk from uh, web to mobile with native script and Angular, I believe. And uh, we should go and check out what other native elements we can see there yeah? when we are on different platforms. So how do we access element ref? The view child decorator lets us query the element, elements in our view. It is another of uh, DOM slash UI abstraction. So instead of doing something like document query selector uh, to query the DOM, we use view queries and query the views. We simply place a template reference variable on an element and pass it to the view child decorator as the first parameter. It, it was querying, it will query if querying a, a component tag, or querying a component tag also gives us an element ref, since components create an HTML element. But if we pass in the component class symbol, we'll get a reference to the instance of that component. Yeah, 
Your child can be tricky a bit, yes, sometimes. <laughs> uh, okay, views. So we have elements, and they are being views sometimes, always in the views. So what is the view? The view is the Angular documentation defines it as the smallest grouping, smallest group of elements that can be created and destroyed together. And you see the snippet of code, it feels familiar, yeah? That's the view. And, and that's really it. The view is really defined by the template, a group of elements that Angular can create and, and destroy together. We have two kinds of them. There's a host view and there's embedded view. And the first one, the host view, is a view that belongs to a component. It's sometimes also called a component view. So there's lots of uh, confusion in uh, terminology, yeah, which we try to a bit debunk or, or systematize here. Uh, so yeah, let's have a look at this component guy. If the view, which the, the host view is a view which belongs to it, then let's have a look at this. So we have a component. So component consists usually from component class, component directive, and some, uh, some template. And, and it, so it's the component, uh, we define the, the view literally on the component directive. As you can see, there's a selector and there's a template there. And this is what is at the end that composes, that defines the view, the, the host view of the component. Um, is, is the view static? Can I modify a view? Well, Angular documentation says that uh, properties of elements in a view can change dy dynamically, but the structure, number, and order can't. But you can change the structure of elements like inserting, moving, removing nested views within the containers. That's a bit uh, tough um, 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 sentence, but it's quite like, important to understand. In short, how can I modify the views? We can modify views by modify nested view containers. So then natural question arises, what is your container? So view container is a container for the dynamically created views. This is a container for the views, right? And we can see here, we have two examples of, of containers. Actually, there's one more. Uh, but we see on a div, we, we, can, we can actually use any element to create, to use it as a view container. And the first example is a div. We place view, um, we place template reference variable in, on it and we can ask for its view container. Same happens with the ng container, although this one is the best to use in such cases because it's a semantic use, right? And I know Ashita is very into semantic HTML, so. <laughs> uh, of course, you can, you know, there's, there's, there's more uh, places where there's more containers or things which can be containers. So we said any element, including ng template, which we'll cover in a sec. Also, it's worth noting that the component, the host view, also makes it a view container. And with the component itself, it's a first view in that uh, container. Although it's not dynamically created, so you won't be able to move it around. Yeah? So it's still part of this, the, the view. Uh, view container has an anchor element. And that's a very important thing. Uh, the containers, they have to be anchored somewhere in the, in the DOM. They have to be attached to something, right? So it's totally required, and, and it's one-to-one -one relationship. Angular documentation actually highlights it. Uh, each view container can have only one element, and each element can only have one view container. So, if it needs the view container, view container needs an anchor element. What with the cases when nothing gets rendered, like ng container doesn't output anything. Same with ng template, it doesn't output any markup at the beginning unless you do something about that. So what is the anchor element? So Angular renders for us in such instance the 
HTML common tag. It's there, it's, it's, now we can anchor to it, and but it doesn't impact the view. Um, another thing about view containers, that they're always rendered, so views added to the container, they're always placed they are rendered as a sibling element to anchor element. So view container has an anchor element. Anything which we, we add to that container will be rendered afterwards. Yeah? So you recognize that behavior from a uh, router, router outlet um, directive. It is a container as well. And, and the router instantiates all the components after that, uh, after the anchor tag. Yeah? So we can see them underneath the router outlet. Uh, tag. I was actually interested what you put, uh, what happens if I query for view container ref on, on, on that directive yeah, by placing view uh, template reference variable on it and, and doing view uh, uh, child query on it and what are the, what's inside, what are the embedded views there. Check it out for yourself, it's quite interesting. Uh, view container Okay, view container ref, so we, we told that about all the refs, so all concept in Angular, at least on this uh, UI abstraction layer, they have all the refs to represent the, the concept in the code. View container ref is representation of the view container, of course, and a part of that is offers also an uh, API to modifying the view container, and that's actually the essence of modifying the view, right? We modify the view by modifying the View containers in. And there are two core methods here which we use sometimes or often create embedded view for embedded views and create a component for component views, host views. Mm. Before we start playing with view container, let's have a look how we can uh, access, get hold of it. So, one way is via view query. Uh, similar to uh, what we were doing with element ref, you can uh, place a um, template reference variable on it and, and use view uh, chart query to query for it. And in this case, by default, it will return you an element ref because you know we're querying on, on, on a paragraph tag. But if you specify I want view container ref, this is what we will get. And then we have uh, we can also ask on a constructor of the directive or component directive, and it will get injected from uh, from the injector. We actually don't cover it much here, but the the, the dependency uh, injection mechanism in Angular closely follows the the, the the view structure in the form of tree. So each each view will effectively have its own injector with ready instances of view, con view container ref or element ref and so on. So here we have, what do we have here? We have view container, still view container ref, we have a component and we place a so first example in, in practice how it looks like and we place an ng container on it. We see how it's rendered on the, on the right. So we, we recognize the, the comment because ng container doesn't output anything but the container, which is the purple box, needs one. And we can read that using uh, every child, and we can use its API to create a component in it. And as we said, it will get rendered as a sibling element to an anchor element, similar like the router outlet directive, right? Uh, and that rule applies to, to, to read to everything. Oh. There's a screen from like if we start debugging that view container in ref in the browser, you will see, you know, we just created the view there. So it's in this internal array embedded views. We can see that view container ref is associated to to the view, to the host view. It has to be uh, it has to reside in some view. And we see that it's anchor element, a native element is an HTML comment on the bottom. Um, same applied to, you know, we, we did the example with uh, ng container. This one is a simple paragraph. So as we said, any element can be used as a view container ref. 
uh, so as soon as you place a, a template reference variable, you ask for your container ref, you get it, and you can start putting some views in it. And we're doing it here, and the result is on the right. And in this case, the only difference is that there is no uh, HTML comment in it uh, there because it's not needed. The paragraph can serve perfectly well as a, as an anchor element. Um, same case with components, with directive, um, directive, directive components, because yeah, component extends directive. We can uh, access the container ref on its con uh, constructor. And you can start adding views to that um, container. This may, may be less common in, in case of components, but with structural directive, it's a very common thing that you ask for view container ref on the constructor. Okay, so that's, uh, I, I, I personally think that view container ref is quite an like, uh, important thing to, to understand and to spend some it was a bit of interest of, of mine. So. But anyway, uh, it's, a, it's all about real anchor elements and it's associated with the host view and it offers us API to create and move views, both host views and Embedded views. And as we learned, it's always uh, all the views added to the container will be rendered on a, next to the anchor element, right? Um, that was it about views, yeah? Thank you, Martin. And the view containers. OK. So now it must be time to talk about template ref. So um, in talking about template ref, we actually need to talk about ng templates, embedded views, and structural directives. But let's have a look at template ref to start off with. Um, OK, Angular gives us a special tag uh, called ng template. The docs refers to that as uh, the embedded template. And a template ref is basically a representation of ng template. And it can be used to instantiate an embedded view. So, OK, so a few things about embedded views then. First of all, as we saw earlier, views are a group of elements which can be created and destroyed together. Views defined in ng-template are called embedded views. As with templates, they can be, as with any templates, they can be reused. We use ng-template in our component templates all the time when we use ng-if and ng4, and maybe ng-switch. <laughs> embedded views, um, they get um, instantiated programmatically and embedded into a component view. And uh, to me, I'm thinking, why are they called embedded views? Perhaps because they're embedded into our main view, they get called embedded views. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> One difference between host views and embedded views is host views create an actual HTML element with the view defined in the component template as its content. So, and with uh, embedded views, the view defined in the ng template are not actually wrapped in any extra tags, so they get rendered as siblings uh, to each other in, in just the container. As with templates, embedded views are not rendered until instantiated. They get instantiated by uh, the view, view container refs create embed, embedded view method. Which we saw here, you see here on the detail. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have a closer look at the um, create embedded view method. Um, so. Embedded views, once rendered, would change the structure of the component view. As we know, uh, to change the structure of a view, um, we can do that by using view containers. That's what Martin was explaining before. The uh, co view container ref API has a method called create embedded view, which um, we can pass in the template ref. Uh, as the first parameter, and optionally, we can give the context uh, to the ng-template, 
and the index on where to insert this view. And if uh, um, by default it will be just inserted at the at the as the last entry in the container. So let's have a look at how to instantiate the embedded views. Okay, so we could actually instantiate embedded views from our component class. Uh, we can query, uh, we can like use a ng uh, container to be our container because that to me it's, uh, you know, it makes sense to keep the markup semantic, so containers of containers, templates of templates. So, okay, we can get hold of the view container reference for an ng container and uh, get hold of um, the template that we want to instantiate and from uh, using the view child queries in our component class and uh, then use call the view, view container ref .create embedded view method passing in that template we got hold of. This would create an instance of the embedded view um, that will be rendered as a sibling to the view container which um, here, since we're using ng contain, uh, container, it is rendered as a comment. Um, and ng container and ng templates are not actual HTML elements, so Angular turns them into HTML comments. Exactly. Okay. Next one. Mm -hmm. So we could also place um, a directive to instantiate um, an embedded view. We can also place a directive on ng template itself. Through dependency injection, our, so I've got an example here, which is dinosaur instantiate view. I mean, dino <laughs> instantiate view directive. So our directive can, uh, through dependency injection, get hold of the template the view container reference, and since it's uh, placed on a template, ng template, the, the template ref uh, of the host element, um, and uh, then call the view container uh, ref create embedded view method passing in the template that will instantiate the view. So that's a template which instantiates itself and adds itself <laughs> to the view. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the directive we cr just created is actually called a structural directive because it's one that's changing the DOM structure um, and adding, yeah, adding elements to our view. So the asterisk followed by the directive attribute name marks is the syntax to mark the to mark structural directives. Um, but we don't need to create our own uh, directive to instantiate a view. Or using this manual approach yeah, at the mm -hmm. very beginning, yeah, which you were showing. So Angular gives us um, ng template outlet directive, which does exactly that. So we can just place that onto our container, like ng container uh, star ng template refer uh, outlet equals, and give mm -hmm. it get hold of the um, ng template. And here, it's quite funny to me because we get hold of the ng template using uh, the, the hash template reference variable, which gives us the template ref of the ng template. But the terminologies are quite same, but obviously template ref is different to template reference variable. But okay, we get hold of the Template ref and pass template. it. What was template ref? <laughs> template ref is a resignation of is ng the template. Reference to the ng template. And so the template we pass. Yeah. <laughs> so we pass that to um, just the ng template outlet directive, mm -hmm. and that is like sugar syntax for creating, instantiating the view for us. So we see our code is looking much neater. <laughs> Then the first manual approach. Then, right? then the one which we did in the um, component class where we use view child query to get hold of it and do it in the class ourselves. Yeah, we could do instead of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, um, so maybe 
we can have a closer look at um, a closer look at structural directives. Angular's documentation explains this really well about how structural directives um, work and how they get desugared into the ng template syntax. Um, so the as I said, the um, asterisk mark, mark structural directives, but it, um, so behind the scenes, it does a little bit more. Um, I've got here the Angular's ng4 structure directive desugared into ng template, so maybe let's have a look at that. Um, the string we assign to ng4 directive is not the usual template expression, but a micro syntax. Angular wraps the host element that ng4 is placed on, the div, into a ng template tag. The microsyntax parser turns the string assigned to ng4 into um, attributes that it places on the ng template tag. The let keyword declares a in template input variable that you can reference within that template. So here, uh, let hero of heroes uh, on the div becomes let dash hero on the ng template. So the parser also does like take takes the off and the track by in the ng um, four case and prepends that with the directive name. So ng it becomes ng four off and ng four track by and places them into, onto the ng-template tag, uh, and these become the input properties of the directive, which is the ng4 directive that implements creating, instantiating the templates passed in um, for each of the heroes in this case. So, that's, that's all, yeah? So, so every, yeah, it's bottom line is that every time we see asterisk and then some, yeah. some directive, it literally yes. gets wrapped into ng template, right? Yeah. So that's why by default mm -hmm. it's getting rendered. We will have to do some, some work there to instantiate those views. Okay, so... Do you want to uh, talk about oh, context? Yes. No. Yes, so... <laughs> Not enough time. Have we run out of time? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, so if we maybe have a quick look before wrapping up about uh, the template input variables, um, which so as we saw in the create component uh, uh, create embedded view um, method of the view container ref, the second parameter is passing in the context to it. So that's where you can pass some context to the ng template, so it can use the data. So um, the, the context is basically an object where the first, the first um, property is dollar implicit. So that is why in the case of ng4, you don't have to say hero equals. So it kind of, it uses implicit, dollar implicit as the first um, um, variable and then the rest are named. So um, yeah, so basically the context you pass in is an object in which the template can make use of. <laughs> basically the context makes the embedded view quite dynamic as well, yeah? It can have yeah. its inputs and, 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 and dynamic parts, yeah? So yeah, summary. Uh, we, we, yeah, that, that was the idea, to maybe help understand better bigger picture, right? I don't know if we managed or not. Hopefully we didn't create more confusion. <laughs> And uh, hopefully it's the less confusion. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And we would like to give credits to uh, Ultimate Angular uh, course, where that's where I learned um, first started learning about dynamic components and heard about uh, custom templates and Angular in depth. So if you're not following Angular in depth, they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of material about <laughs> that, that, these things, and they're quite in depth, yeah. And I called mm -hmm. the Angular, the ultimate Angular, mm -hmm. also was explaining yeah. it for pretty nice, and mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. Yeah. So, so that's us. Thank, thank you. you very much for coming to the <laughs>
thank you again, guys, for putting that together last minute. It was great. Um, so just a, a few minutes break, and then uh, things will be kicking off again. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Um, before we jump into the next thing, just a, another reminder about the uh, Angular panel tomorrow. I've only got a few questions on there at the minute. So if you have any questions or you can think of anything that might be interesting to ask the um, Angular team tomorrow, do head on over to Slido using the event code Angular Connect. You can also give feedback from the talks from today as well. So our next speaker, Isagul, is a developer expert at Google for web technologies and a very active conference speaker. In fact, I think this is her fourth year at Angular Connect, so no stranger to us. She previously worked as a senior software engineer at Narwhal and Autodesk Play, working extensively with VR. She enjoys teaching at a variety of nonprofit organizations, aiming to increase diversity in the software industry. So please give a very warm welcome to Isagul. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here, back here. I'm so jet-lagged, but I'm happy. Um, as Ed said, I'm a Google developer expert for Angular team and web technologies. And uh, my name is really, really hard to pronounce. Um, and there's a research. I know who did that. But uh, if people can't pronounce your name, they don't believe in you. Um, so I changed my name on Twitter to I something. If you remember the first three letters, you were fine. And I really enjoy putting uh, dinosaurs around. Um, if I can't find them, then I can put um, augmented reality dinosaurs around. So um, Angular Connect is the right place for me this year. <laughs> Just want to give you an overview. What we are going to talk about today is uh, what is available, the web APIs that makes um, the XR um, possible, WebXR, and geolocation, because um, the XR experience that we are going to create is uh, depending on the location. And the other part of the, uh, the, uh, this talk is about how to integrate um, the APIs into Angular and um, creating real-time applications, and most importantly, uh, creating reusable component libraries. You can find my slides at bit.ly uh, WebXR 2018. Uh, and you can find all of the code and much more than the, than the things that I'm able to say today on my GitHub. And um, the live demo will be available on Immersive Web, that app. So um, thank you for, for coming here. And um, some of you might wonder why this is augmented reality and WebXR at the same time. So I just wanted to give you uh, some overview. Um, so we have reality where we are now, and um, we have the virtual reality where everything is made up, uh, everything is 3D, everything is uh, rendered, and augmented reality is something in between. And the web APIs that we have were called uh, WebVR, but then uh, they, they're changed to uh, WebXR device APIs to enable uh, augmented reality experiences on the web as well. So this is reality. If you are having a surgery, if you are going to get uh, amputated or um, anything on that you have two off, this is what people do. And till the very last minute, until you go into the surgery room, uh, people ask you many, many times, like, which side? Which side it is? I've been there twice, and it's a horrible experience. Uh, but recently, in the United States, uh, Food and Drug Administration approved uh, Halo, um, Microsoft Halo glasses, which is, uh, which is an augmented reality glass. What you have is uh, real-time information right in front of you just by wearing a glass. So now, uh, when you go into surgery, people have so much more information than you know, what you write on your own body. And uh, virtual reality is also... Uh, part of it. So this is a brain scan, uh, scan of your brain, and then the surgeons uh, can walk through in your brain in every level. And if they wanted to find something, they will find it there. Uh, it's not just games and um, entertainment. And there's so many great applications that we can create with the uh, WebXR. And today is the time to create it, because Right now, there are uh, hundreds of millions of uh, devices that have the capability that we are not taking full advantage of. Uh, and relevant content at the right time and right place is very, very important. 
And lastly, web is very important to me, although uh, our um, devices, Android and iPhones, are so much more capable when it comes to uh, creating 3D content, but web is very important because it's available to everyone. So uh, if you want to create something, uh, where do you go today? Um, uh, web XR is available on Chrome Canary, and the rest of it is available under a uh, few flags. Uh, this is what you do. You type in Chrome Flags uh, Web XR, and then there's Web XR Hit Test, uh, and, and you can enable um, developer tools experiments too to be able to um, debug your application very well. So WebGL is uh, very much in use everywhere and available in every browser, but WebXR support is unfortunately not there. And um, the other thing that we can do today is, uh, if you're, you're using Chrome, one thing that you can do is you can sign up for origin trials, and that allows every user that comes to your website to have this experience without having to enable any of the flags, which is a really cool thing. And we are developing some WebXR polyfills. Mozilla is developing, and then the Immersive Web is developing. Um, so some of the capabilities that are not implemented by some of the browsers will be available by using the polyfills. And lastly, the thing that we can do, and we must do in any case, is um, having a progressive web experience. If your user comes into your website and they don't have the device, um, to be able to see the 3D content. They can just uh, click around with the 3D and then um, use their mouse. And if they have an XR device, they can have the same experience in the XR, and then um, AR is the other part of it. And there's a lot of tools today out there. Although everything is pretty new, we still have a lot of open source uh, resources and uh, open source libraries. And one of them here on top is A-Frame. It's a very easy to use declarative language, and it's really, really nice. But I really like 3JS, so that's what we are going to use today. And Polly on the um, left-hand side here is an open source um, low polygon model library. So you can take any of these models from there for free and use it. And it has a great API. So why are, <laughs> am I using uh, 3JS? Because 3JS is very flexible. Uh, A-Frame, although it's really, really easy to use and really uh, nice, but it doesn't give you all that much flexibility or performance. Um, and also, I think it's really, really fun. So let's be good developers and write some pseudocode. What we need to do when we uh, have this Angular component that we wanted to create uh, for an AR experience is that first we check if the AR is available on the device of the user. And once, it is, once we know that it's available, uh, entering an AR is going to be an experience. You are going to either um, touch somewhere or click a button to start the experience. Um, once the um, AR is started, we start a session uh, on the device. And in every movement of the user, we re-render the scene um, that's behind. So what we have is the stream, video stream of the user, what they see. And then we are rendering on top of it a 3D content. And first thing, we, we check uh, how the device is uh, available, um, if the WebXR is available or not, is uh, by checking those um, flags that we um, enabled at the very beginning. For example, the request hit test. And um, what we render is a canvas with the uh, video stream. Uh, and canvas can have uh, multiple uh, contexts, one of them is 2D or 3D. And in this case, we are going to check if these stakes are present. Uh, we are going to start our session with this context. And then um, once the once the um, session is available, we are going to uh, start rendering. So uh, WebGL is uh, the 3D graphics library that's available in the browser. And um, 
we need a WebGL render, which is a kind of like um, taking take, take, render is something like taking a video or a photograph of the 3D thing that you are creating. But we all, we need to make this uh, render to be uh, transparent, to have opacity in the background, so we can render the real world in the background. And we can enable some shadows anytime we put a model into our world. We can uh, add some shadows or lighting to have extra reality. And um, once we um, set our uh, context, we still have to check if the particular device that you are, your user have is, um, is compatible with the session that you're trying to create. Once we have that, we can um, add, add a scene. Well, we can start our scene and then add any um, objects to our scene. So what I mean by scene is um, you can think of it as a stage. Everything that you have, every light and every object is going to be hold inside this object, which is a container object, basically. And how many of you are familiar with request animation frame? Anyone? No animators around. Um, so request animation frame is um, uh, available to us in regular JavaScript. But uh, what we have here is specific to XR session. The uh, session's request animation frame have access to the uh, pose of the camera and also tries to uh, render really fast, 60 frames per second. <clears throat> so uh, what I didn't include here is creating the 3D geometry and materials and mesh, but um, I, my first talk here, this is my fourth, uh, was about WebGL, WebGL in general, uh, not WebXR, so you can uh, watch that on the Angular Connect um, channel. Uh, but one thing I really wanted to give you is that I found this uh, really cool um, resources that explains how to create more reality by using materials and um, texture maps. So we are really concerned about the data that we are sending. Uh, we don't want to have a very detailed uh, model that we have to re-render constantly with every move of the user. Um, to enable us to ha have a little bit um, more sleek experiences, we, we can bring more reality by using textures or um, lighting and material. And there are great resources on those links. And um, I mentioned we are going to use uh, Poly, so I can um, show you. Well, I want to show you the website, but it's not possible. Um, but <clears throat> Poly has uh, lots of models. Everyone uh, is free to add their own models, uh, but there are some professional models there, too. It's uh, developed by Google. And it has a great API. Not only you can download the models, but you can also just make a uh, HTTP request to get the models. And you can even have a little search box on your application so people can uh, search for any models, maybe dinosaurs in this case, um, and put whatever um, thing that they wanted to put that into that location. So uh, to be able to use this API, you have to have an API key uh, from the poly, and it's uh, very easy, and you have to include that. And once you have that model, you have to add it to your scene, and um, there's a lot of... Um, there's uh, different formats of the models, and here I'm uh, checking the format is what I'm looking for, because there are different, with different formats, you have to have different loaders. And um, if we, um, how we do the um, user interaction, if you, have you guys ever used any VR devices? If you are using a, a very low-end VR device, what you have is you don't have some he headset. For example, the Google Cardboard doesn't have anything. You can just pop it in, your, um, in a cardboard. And what you use instead of um, clicking or hand devices is your uh, vision. So 
what you do is wherever you turn, uh, you light, uh, you cast a light towards an object, and that's, that becomes your selection. Same mentality is available also uh, for AR. And instead of where we are looking at, because we don't have the um, head position with AR, what we do is where, you, where you're clicking is from the point that you're clicking, we are going to be casting some rays. And once we do that, we are looking for some hits uh, all the way through, like uh, we are looking through everywhere that, that light goes through and see if any object is being hit, and that becomes our selection. And there are other cool things that you could do uh, when it comes to interactivity is uh, by using voice. Um, a great library is the Resonance Spatial Audio. So that allows you to create um, audio that sounds uh, very different and that comes from different uh, places. For example, you can attach a, some kind of noise to a dinosaur. Uh, I don't know how you could do that. But, and put it on different places. And if you are wearing a headset, the uh, sounds are coming from different places, and um, you can use that to create great experiences. The rest of the code, is, uh, there's just a lot of details, and I didn't want to include it. Um, and this is pretty much the overview and overall, but you can find all of the details um, on my repo. And let's talk about Angular. <laughs> um, creating UI libraries is too much work, said Raj to me one day. Um, what he meant was uh, if you're creating a reusable component library, you have to create another repo, and then you have to uh, package it and go back to your project and reinstall it, reuse it. And this, this is a really horrible uh, thing to do, and that's why we kept repeating and copying and pasting the same code between different uh, projects all the time. But luckily, um, folks at Narval created um, NX extension. It's an extension on top of Angular uh, CLI, and it's very uh, lightweight. And what it does is it allows you to create um, reusable libraries and makes few of the other things very easy. And not only that, they created uh, Angular Console, which is a UI that makes it really, really easy to use. So this is uh, Angular Console UI, and I already have the app. Um, and if I click on it, I have a bunch of uh, options here. And these are the things that are commonly uh, being used. So these are some of my libraries. And um, usually, I'm either serving my applications or uh, creating a new component. So these are the uh, most common things. But there's also another way which you can go through all of the Angu Angular's um, materials uh, schema or um, Angular CLI schema and choose any of the um, any of the options without having to remember all of the arguments to it. So let's create a new library. Um, let's call it Angular Connect AC. Once you name your library, you can either define a directory, uh, and then you can make it publishable very easily. So. This is creating a, a library in the same repository with the application, but you can easily export it and um, use it, publish it somewhere else. And we have a um, few other options, and these are all the, of the options that are usually come with the um, CLI. And once we click, we generate a new app, new library, and um, with the same way, you can create a component and service. And the cool part about it is that uh, you don't actually have to remember any of the, these things, and you, you have drop downs and select them. I really do like it. So what happens when, uh, when you have these libraries? Um, And um, another person, John, said, creating UI libraries adds lots of extra code. 
because if you're starting to a project and then you start to organize your code so much, people tend to think that it's just uh, too much work and not sure if it's worth it, overly complicating things. And there's lots of UI libraries out there that you can um, use, and why do I create my own uh, UI library? And even though you have your, uh, you, you, if you are using something like Angular Material, for example, to create a um, data table, you still have to implement the sorting, filtering, uh, headers, or any other thing. And in John's case, he created 12 of them. So at the end, these things adds up. And over time, when you wanted to change anything in your application, then you have 12 of these things that you have to change and manage, and new bugs are created all the time. <coughs> With um, NX, and you can do this in any other way, too, uh, but this is the way I have been doing, you can create uh, different applications, and, and in this case, demo for this demo, and code for good is, are the two applications that I have. And they're sharing uh, some of the libraries, and they have their own library, um, own separate libraries. So what we have here is a UI components and, um, and UI shell. But I created an extra um, specific to XR because I can use it in, for both uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And the feature uh, library is where I have, I, I have the specific features with smart components which has the data and the state in it. So how do we create these uh, components to make sure that they're re reusable all around in all of our applications? Uh, we use a lot of inputs and outputs and a lot of options. And this was already available to us when we were using AngularJS with directives. We did have all of these options, but it's so much more intuitive now and uh, very easy. We can give default values, and uh, anytime we have to change anything, um, all we have to do is add to these options, and uh, we don't have to break any other code. And um, the data that we have it, in this case is going to be location data that's coming asynchronously is going to be in my feature library, which has the uh, smart components with the state in it. And I can pass in this data using the async pipe uh, in my smart component to, um, to my view components. But one thing that, uh, that happens most of the time is people, uh, well, mm, sometimes we uh, do, um, <laughs> we do use this async pipe many times in ma many different places in the same uh, component. And that uh, subscribes to the data data source that we are using and sometimes makes uh, multiple calls. So that's something to um, be mindful of. And the other thing that we are using here for this application is um, um, Firebase GeoFire. This is one of the newer uh, applications. And what it allows you to do is to save your data with a geolocation attached to it. And when you need it to, uh, to query those data, what you can do is give uh, a range to a radius, and then it will calculate to, the, to your point anything that's around you, pretty much what uh, Google Maps is doing, but for your database. So let's see uh, what it does. And this is um, Firebase's geolocation. What, what it does, the GeoFire is specifically uh, different than the, um, the other storage is uh, creates a different data type which you can query um, with that. One uh, very uh, unfortunate thing uh, with developing for WebXR is having to debug your applications. It's uh, kind of painful. Hopefully, it will get a little bit better in the future. What you do is, um, if you haven't seen it in your developer tools, you can go um, to More Tools and then um, go to Remote Devices. 
and it will give you all of the devices that are connected. And you have to also uh, enable the developer options on your device. And once you have that, you can enter any URL and reload from here and inspect. So I'm going to start my session. Oh, OK. <clears throat> What we are doing here is looking for, um, <laughs> unfortunately, my cable is not so far away. Uh, I can't move that much. But what we are doing is uh, looking for um, smooth surfaces to render our uh, creatures. Say hi to the internet. <laughs> um, hopefully, you try it out after the party and put some dinosaurs around. and. Um, the dinosaurs are attached with the geolocation information, and wherever you are, we request the same data to, um, from the geofire and then render the, um, render the dinosaurs. So <clears throat> where to go from here? Um, the WebXR API is being discussed at the moment, and you can be part of it. Uh, it uh, you can go to Immersive Web on GitHub and um, create an issue or comment on the issue. And if you're creating something and these APIs are being created for you, you should be part of the conversation. There are a few blog posts, blogs and um, a few other resources here. And I have other demos if you wanted to check it out for AR and VR. And thank you so much. Thank you, Isago. OK, so um, in a few minutes, we're, we've got uh, Shai over in track one. If you haven't seen Shai speak before, I can tell you now it's something to behold. So um, recommend you get over there. So we're all heading over to track one starting in a few minutes. Thank you.